for March 24th, 2015 to order at 10 a.m. And uh, first of all, I just want to ask Council for your consideration of switching agenda items um, four and six, so that six would come before business arising for the minute, so we could have our delegation first, and then he may uh, be able to leave. Councillor Thick. Second. Okay, so moved and seconded by Councillors Thick and McMaster to amend the agenda to move item six before item four. I'll call the question. All in favor? Thank you. And a motion to adopt the agenda as amended. So moved. Thank you, Councillor McMaster. Seconded by Councillor Thick. All in favor? Thank you very much. Motion carried. Okay, we have minutes from the regular council meeting from March 10th. Good adoption. Thank you, Councillor McMaster. Second. Seconded by Councillor Blanchette. All in favor? Thank you. Motion carried. All right, so which means, first of all, we will have our delegation, and we do have Mr. Taryn Moore here from Ocean Network Canada to <coughs> present to Council on the uh, Tsunami Detection Radar project out at the Tsunami Coolid Airport. So welcome. Great. You have up to 15 minutes, Great, and then yeah. we have, uh, if we have any questions, we will ask you. Excellent. And I'll, I'll give you a two-minute warning if you like. Or you have oh, that'd be warning. great, yeah. Okay. Great, thanks. Okay, excellent. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, Mayor Osborne and, and Council, for, for having me today. Uh, I'd like to appreciate the, uh, the Challenge of the Territory uh, for having me. Uh, I come from Victoria. My name is Terry Moore, and I work with Ocean Networks Canada. Uh, previously, I, I was working with Emergency Management for British Columbia, so I see some familiar faces from the world of emergency management. And uh, today I'm here to talk a little bit about um, an exciting project that Ocean Networks Canada is uh, doing currently up in the uh, Long Beach Airport to do with uh, emergency management public safety, but specifically for tsunamis. So I'd like to just sort of uh, inform the council and, and Mayor Osborne about the project and uh, offer up any uh, opportunity for some discussion and questions as far as project and the status of the project as it goes forward. So um, thanks for having me. And again, um, so I'd like to talk about the uh, WIRA radar, which uh, uh, is an exciting opportunity to, uh, for Ocean Networks Canada to explore applied oceanography. So making science and applying that to uh, sort of real world or applied solutions. And, and this is uh, one of the projects that we're looking at or we're working on uh, to do with public safety. So I'd like to discuss that a little bit. So before I start, Ocean Networks Canada is a, a project, a not-for-profit project of UVic. So we're a part of the university and we have a mandate towards um, ocean science, uh, sort of overall, so it's a very broad mandate. There's about a hundred of us that work at the university, um, between engineers that are installing instruments, and uh, scientists that are taking the, the data from the instruments and sort of analyzing that and supporting research on ocean science and environment. Uh, and then a sort of a more administrative side, which is the side that, that I work on. So uh, it's very exciting, um, right sort of here in British Columbia, and really working towards promoting uh, Canadian science and Canadian scientists, but also on a global sort of scale. So uh, Smart Oceans BC is a recent project that we've been funded by, mostly by the federal government, so Western Economic Diversification and Transport Canada, to start applying some of that oceanographic science towards uh, stuff that, that, that people can, can sort of grasp and it aids people day to day. And that's uh, a real big part of this project today. So Smart Oceans BC has three sort of prongs to it. The first one is the one that I'll talk most about today, so public safety. Uh, now that's earthquake early warning and a tsunami detection. So essentially Ocean Networks Canada has a, a lot of instruments, very high tech instruments offshore and onshore that are uh, doing things like detecting earthquakes, uh, seeing what kind of magnitudes, judging where the epicenter is of earthquakes. And we're looking into research to sort of uh, try to uh, detect earthquakes before the shaking starts uh, to give people warning. So that's a, an emerging technology that the uh, University of Victoria is looking at in Ocean Networks Canada. Tsunami detection is what I'll talk to you about today. Uh, and then the other problems are towards marine safety. So vessel traffic, as British Columbia coast gets more and more uh, traffic with uh, with um, imports and exports, and also with uh, proponents looking at LNG and potentially um, oil and gas, uh, the safety of vessels is, is of supreme importance. And so Ocean Networks Canada is looking at ways to use their instruments and use science and use products of that science for people to make sure that uh, that vessel safety is as safe as, can, as it can possibly be. Sea state monitoring is another piece of that, which is basically seeing what the currents and what the waves are doing at any moments 
uh, in sort of real time so that mariners, again, have that sort of situational awareness around uh, what is currently happening in the, in the state of the sea. And then environmental monitoring is a, a, another piece that Ocean Networks Canada is very passionate about to do with uh, ocean acidification, sea level rise, global warming, um, and also biological pieces around so whale habitats and ecosystems and things like that. So uh, again, a very broad mandate looking at the ocean health. Uh, so this is what smart oceans look like in a, in a, in a bit of a graphic. Uh, so the, all of the sort of icons look at new installations that are going in. Most of those are uh, coupled with current installations. So at the bottom here, uh, offshore, we have about an 800 kilometer loop of cable, fiber optic cable that's uh, connected to equipment at the bottom of the sea that's collecting data on things like temperature and, and acidification and, and um, listening to uh, whales and different things out in the ocean. And on these, uh, on these, um, this network, we are putting uh, the earthquake sensors that I talked to you about, um, and also there's bottom pressure recorders there, which are looking at uh, the column of the water above those sensors. So for things like tsunamis, you can get an idea of uh, what kind of tsunami might be coming in over here at the very far end of of uh, the Juan de Fuca plate, and what that might mean for a tsunami coming inshore. Um, Further up the coast, we have uh, areas in Prince Rupert and Kitimat, which are expanding their port facilities, expanding the marine facilities, and of their uh, Ocean Networks Canada and Smart Oceans is focused mostly on that vessel safety, uh, marine traffic, and also that environmental baseline to be able to understand better sort of what's the current state of the environment uh, before a lot of the uh, expansions and, and sort of um, increased traffic occurs in that area, so that you can kind of see what the, the cause and effect might be of those sorts of projects. Um, uh, I also mentioned that earthquake early warning sensors. So these uh, up in the North Vancouver Island area are sensors that are located on in, in school buildings mostly, and those are P wave sensors. So a P wave happens before uh, the, the, the shaking of, a, of an earthquake, and this is right along the Nootka Fault Line, or the landward side of the Nootka Fault Line, so an area of high uh, activity for seismic events. And then uh, the last one here is this um, sort of shaded area uh, right here, and that's the, that's the radar that we're installing at the airport. And essentially what that is doing is, um, is looking at uh, the, the tsunami detection uh, for a nearshore event, and I'll, I'll get into more of that here in a second. So this is essentially what it looks like, although this has recently changed a little bit. So this is the, the Long Beach Airport. Um, essentially we have a, a transmitter here. Uh, there are four uh, transmit uh, antennas, uh, fairly small antennas and then a receive array of 12 antennas that are, again, taking in that, um, that, uh, that uh, some of the, the array here, the transmitter array sends out uh, a radio magnetic wave, and that wave bounces off the, the actual current, the surface of the ocean, and it comes back over here. And in this container here is basically electronics and a server that crunches down those data numbers and then tells us something about what's out there. Uh, so just yesterday, though, the, the team is up there currently. They're here all week. Uh, engineers and, and people from uh, from Germany, where the technology is from, uh, but also from uh, Newfoundland, where the radars are made, and then from Ocean Networks Canada, where the actual installation and the uh, the engineers are coming from. So, uh, although yesterday this turned out to be a better place over here, and then this is going to be over here, but nonetheless, it's still the same sort of uh, configuration. Okay, so let's look at uh, what, it, what it might produce. This is one that's been put in into Iceland, and essentially, it's looking at the characteristics of the surface of the ocean. So it's saying what are the current speeds, what are the current directions, and also what are the wave heights. Uh, and of course, the, the benefit of this sort of day-to-day -day is that you can see uh, rip currents or you can see swells coming in, and uh, there are many applications for that. Uh, and of course, of course, there are opportunities to explore what kind of applications uh, we might have for, for our radar um, off, of, uh, off of our coast. Uh, you'll also notice there's a bit of a difference here. This, these are two different systems, so they're able to get a triangulation that's a little more enhanced than, than our system that we'll be able to put in, and I'll, I'll show you a graphic of what ours might be able to, to do for us, but it is a little bit of a different system here, but essentially getting the same data on what is the sea state and what is uh, uh, off, off our shore. So here are the, the specs. Again, <coughs> as I mentioned, 12 receive uh, antennas. These are about four meters high, so not huge, huge radars, not crazy installations. Um, you know, not, to, not too uh, onerous at all. They have a range of about 80 kilometers, so looking out at sort of a, a piece of high that's 80 kilometers in distance. Um, the frequency there, for anybody that's, uh, that understands frequencies, 13.5 megahertz, so it's a fairly high frequency uh, radar. Um, 
but uh, certainly not uh, as high as, uh, as some of the naval radars and some of the, the larger, more stronger pieces. I've, I've been told that the actual uh, wattage of this is less than that of a light bulb, so it's not a strong radar, but it certainly is working at a high frequency. Now, uh, this last bullet here, this is measuring the orbital velocities of the wave particles, so it's looking at the actual waves and what kind of movement those particles are doing within those waves, and it's taking millions of those uh, uh, measurements every sort of every second or so, and it's uh, analyzing those and then and then basically breaking out the average. So, what is the average speed of each sort of wave as it's coming in? And from that, um, they looked back at uh, at you know this with a tsunami application here. They've looked back at the, the Japanese tsunami in 2011 with uh, this Vera radar in Chile and in, and in Hawaii, and they're able to look at the data after that event passed and said, well, if we had tuned it in a certain way, we would have been able to see what kind of wave was coming in. Because as a tsunami comes in on the open ocean, it's very small, it's very shallow, or it's very, um, uh, it, it doesn't have a huge wave in the open ocean. But as it comes in, it slows down and it grows in height, and that's where, of course, the, the uh, um, comes onto land and starts to, uh, to inundate uh, land. But uh, offshore, if you can see these wave anomalies as it comes in, it's not very high, but the, the waves are moving in a different pattern as they normally would. And if you can detect that, then in theory, you might be able to uh, determine what kind of wave might be coming in with sort of algorithms and whatnot. And this is what we're trying to test. So essentially, uh, they looked at this after an event came through and said, we think we can do this. And we're trying to test it out to see if we can do that in, in real time. Uh, so we do have to develop an algorithm for it, so there's a bunch of science, there's a bunch of unknowns in this process, so it's not a done deal, it's not something that's set in stone, it's experimental, it's science, it's looking at um, how we can do this, and if we can do it, how do we then perfect it and make it applicable. So we're a long way off from putting this into some sort of a warning system, uh, but that is the goal, is to put it into a warning system, and working with NOAA and EMBC for them to do the warning part of it, but for this to be a tool in that toolbox to determine what kind of wave is coming into this area over this swath of, of, of area, rather than say a tide gauge, which is sort of one point at one location, which does give good information. This would give uh, a bit of a better picture of, of this coastline, that's for sure. Uh, so again, another tool for the, uh, for the bottom pressure recorders, which I mentioned offshore, tide gauges, which is a, a Canadian Hydrographic Service, and, and buoys, which are run by NOAA, and those are the offshore ones that do the tsunami, that are part of the tsunami warning system. So one, of, one of the things I wanted to stress here is that it does not change any of the alerting procedures for emergency managers and for the public here in Tofino. So essentially, if you think about this uh, earthquake, in, in the worst case scenario here, that earthquake happens for a long period of time, and that's your warning, right? So that's people's warning to get off to high ground. And I think people here are very well uh, aware of, of that uh, risk and the, and the hazard there. We do not want people to be checking the Ocean Networks Canada website to see what the radar is saying as far as wave heights is concerned. So mm -hmm. I think that there has been some, some newspaper coverage that sort of uh, put o Ocean Networks Canada in this light of we will have our own sort of warning system with this radar. That's, that's really not what we're going for. And that's the main message I want you guys to take home today is that uh, essentially this is part of a, a, a bigger picture. This will help, I think, in terms of um, tsunami detection and, and giving information to that warning system. But this isn't a warning system in and of itself. So, uh, so that continues the message of you feel the shaking, you get to high ground after you protect yourself from the shaking, and that's a, that's a key. But what it will do, I think, is um, uh, those, those times when, uh, uh, for example, in 2012, when the Haida Gwaii earthquake and tsunami occurred, uh, people didn't know, right? There was a lack of information, there was a lack of communication, but there was certainly a lack of information. And I think that this might be a good tool, once it gets tuned and once we are able to detect tsunamis with it, to be able to say something like, uh, if everybody is evacuated on the top of a mountain in a safe location, be able to say, well, this is the information that we're gathering right off of your shore. And that's, of course, really valuable to to tell people when it's safe to go home or when it's uh, um, um, sort of when it's a safe time and, and also just to, to get that more information to the authorities and, and down through to the community members that are on the, on the top of the mountain. So I'm, I'm going to leave it at that and open things up for, for questions. Um, and um, yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, Council, any questions? Councillor Fick. Yeah, thank you. Um, I had a couple questions. One is, at the beginning, you acknowledged we were on the territory for Tuluk First Nation. I just wondered, have they or the CBT been informed? Because they're, they're two key people in the research and 
Have, has their council had a presentation too? Yeah, so uh, Ocean Networks Canada has, uh, has done a, a lot of engagement. So we've, we went to the highway, the uh, Hereditary Chiefs Council of Fisheries in January. Uh, so that's, we were able to present <laughs> to, uh, to the Hereditary Chiefs of the Nichiren, uh territories. <laughs> Um, and that was received very well. And we, we did get approval from the West Coast Committee, which has representation from the uh, local First Nations communities. Uh, so as far as uh, an engagement is concerned, I will be meeting with uh, David Dennis later today and uh, some of the folks at the Tolokwit. So um, again, we'll have a similar sort of discussion around any questions they might have, any concerns they might have, and, and take those into consideration. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the other... I'm, I'm curious, at the beginning you said that the, um, in Port Hardy, for example, that the, um, that the uh, radar is situated at the school. Did you mention that? Uh, uh, no, so uh, the radar... Or there's some detection that was affiliated with the school in Port Hardy, is that oh, true? Yeah, no, sorry. Um, yeah, that was uh, for an earthquake early warning system. Uh, not for a tsunami, but for, the, for an earthquake early warning system that Ocean Networks Canada is looking at. Uh, those sensors are located at the at schools, but not in, in Port Hardy, but in uh, Zabalos and Cayuca and uh, Boss Lake and Port Alice and I think McNeil. So mm -hmm. there's five five locations, and that's again, it's it's about uh, detecting uh, earthquake shaking before the shaking occurs at any one location, trying to communicate that information to people before it uh, actually starts shaking. Yeah, and that that would be my main concern here. That I see that these are all there, and I uh, what I'm what I'm reading and what I've heard is that basically with this technology in place is the bottom line that we might gain 20 minutes earlier detection of a possible tsunami. Is that, is that, am I hearing you right? Uh, not quite. Okay. Uh, so as far as detection for, for, the, for the worst case scenario for our offshore, uh, <coughs> this technology will essentially give you more information about that shake that you just felt. So, you, so that, that detection will have occurred because the earthquake will have shaken the area. So, uh, so people here would know that they, they felt the shaking, that there's an earthquake, and that it's uh, potentially large enough to create a tsunami. And so uh, this information, or this radar essentially will give what kind of a wave is coming our way or, or, or is, is sort of on the way. Uh, but for the people that are already evacuating and going up to the top of the mountain, it doesn't actually do that much good because they don't have time to be checking their blackberries as they run up the mountain. And we don't want them to, right? We want them to, to evacuate efficiently and safely and, and, and sort of uh, get to high ground as quickly as possible. So, um, but it will give information for the local authorities, uh, for emergency managers, uh, as that wave's coming in to be able to say, once people are safe and things, to be able to say what kind of wave is coming or, or, or is, because it happens over a long period of time. So, in theory, will give more information for uh, those authorities. Right. I guess I was just thinking about the immediate benefits to the town of Tofino and mm -hmm. how is it that, for example, in a place where our school is in a high-risk area, that we could evacuate 160 kids, you know, more mm -hmm. effectively, more efficiently, mm -hmm. should this should such a, an event occur. So yeah. I'm just trying to tie in what you're saying with the direct benefits to our community mm -hmm. and what it means for our residents to know this information. So mm -hmm. I think I've got the gist of it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just mention, uh, apart from tsunami detection, which is its main goal, mm -hmm. uh, again, if you have information on currents and wave heights, there are other applications for it which we'd like to explore. So for example, with Parks Canada and the Visitor Safety Program, they identify wave hazards, right, for, for road waves and for, for, wa for extreme wave uh, situation. And this tool might be able to be used to help augment that program. Uh, so we've been talking with Parks Canada to sort of figure out ways that once we get the data back, once we see what kind of information we're getting from the waves, that kind of information might be beneficial to Parks Canada, for example. Also for fishers, also for uh, search and rescue applications. Uh, there are many other applications to this, uh, and we're hoping to you know, get as much value as we can day to day. Uh, but essentially the goal is for, for us to be able to give information on that, that tsunami coming in. Uh, but we think that there are other opportunities for day to day applications. And one last question mm -hmm. is the, the funding for all of this is coming through UVic, and I assume that that must be from the federal government. Is, uh, that, is that the case? So yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so Ocean Networks Canada is, is funded by the uh, um, Canadian Foundation for Innovation, so science uh, granting application. That's about 40, 50 percent of our funding. Uh, but this uh, particular program, the Smart Oceans program, is funded 100 percent through the federal government, so through Western Economic Diversification 
which is an Industry Canada uh, granting agency, and through Transport Canada, which uh, has maritime safety focus and, and very much uh, interested in coastal sort of safety. Yeah, that's great, and thank you. And I just, um, I would love to see that this information is somehow also shared or given to the Crop Advisory Trust because they are probably the foremost organization in this area that oversees <coughs> research, and I know that this would be of, of great interest to that organization as well, so thank you. Yeah, I'll write that down, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Burke? Yeah, it's just, um, thank you very much for the presentation. It's helpful to kind of know what's happening on the ground in our region, and uh, especially when it comes to um, uh, such a large concern as earthquakes and tsunamis. So is this going to be something that's um, information available in real time? It is. Yeah, that, that's the goal. It, it, yeah. So again, this is sort of uh, experimental at this phase. Uh, what we're able, what we're going to be doing is uh, we still have to get power to the thing. So we're, we're putting in the array, they're working in the mud right now. Uh, they'll put up the array. Uh, they're not going to be able to turn it on until they get a power pole and, and, the, and the power to the, to the actual transmit array. Uh, but once they turn that on, they'll be able to see what kind of data it gets back, and that will be in real time. So it's going through uh, internet to, uh, to get to, uh, to the University of Victoria where the scientists will take a look at the data. And then what we'll do is try to determine what kind of products can be derived from that data, because a bunch of data doesn't really mean enough, it mean, mean very much unless somebody at the other end can read it and understand it. So again, for things like currents or wave heights, you need to be able to, to understand that. So, uh, so essentially we'll be looking through how best to present that data, and then again looking at the different applications. So with Parks Canada, for example, or with the emergency program, what are the applications that will be most, or for that matter, recreationalists and, and the surf report, right? I mean, there may be applications for different things. So. Uh, determining what kind of data comes back and what kind of data products you can put out there for people to understand and to be able to read. But yes, in, in real time, looking at every, uh, the, the potential is every two minutes to get a read back of what the average sort of uh, current speeds and current direction is and wave heights. So it's a uh, it's very sort of new cutting edge technology for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if there's, um, if there'll be any people stationed with the equipment to whatever monitor it or maintain it, yeah. and if there's any um, job opportunities or educational opportunities associated with it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. I, at this point, Ocean Networks Canada is looking at, um, at Mark Fortune at the airport to and, and to develop a contract or an agreement with, with him and with the ACRD, I believe is the, is the managing agency, to be able to maintain it, so to cut the grass and to make sure that, uh, that things are, are in working order. Uh, so that agreement is being uh, sort of negotiated. Uh, so for that piece, is, uh, uh, that's the maintenance aspect. As far as jobs are concerned, really it's a fairly small operation. So right now there's a, an excavator going in and clearing a little bit of the land to make it flat. Um, and there's a, a little bit of, uh, of work that is being done, but it's really not something that is a whole bunch of, uh, of industrial sort of development by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and as far as maintenance, or uh, sort of ongoing maintenance, it's, it's again fairly benign. There's not a whole lot to be done, just sort of clipping the grass and making sure that things are, are functioning. Uh, as that data sort of comes into UVic, I think that's where a lot of the, um, the opportunities will come in terms of uh, uh, working with the data and trying to determine where the values are. So uh, there will be work for data software engineers and different people uh, to essentially come up with things that, that, that make sense for uh, for using the data and applying the data to sort of whatever applications are the most appropriate. Thanks. Great. Oh, sorry, and you mentioned, sorry, uh, Councillor Anderson, you mentioned education component, and so uh, Smart Oceans BC is uh, funded for doing some outreach and education, so uh, most of that education is, is coming in terms of the biology side of things, the ocean health side of things, so the Clackwet Biosphere Trust, is that the one that was mentioned? Uh, I think is a, probably an agency we're already working with, I'm not certain. I know we were at Whale Fest here a couple of days ago doing some outreach and some community engagement on you know, whales and environment and what our sensors are doing in terms of uh, monitoring sea level rise and things like that. So there is an education component uh, and a lot of that is going towards uh, school curriculum, so trying to in involve uh, ocean science and encourage ocean, ocean science for uh, small rural communities in their coastal areas. Great, thanks. Oh, Councillor Blanchett. Um, you're, uh, it's, qu it's quite thrilling to see this whole sort of big science thing. You're talking millions of data points, big data for sure. Mm -hmm. 
uh, very interesting. <coughs> and I look forward to seeing the results as they, as they fold out from this. Um, I, your transmitter is overlooking Long Beach, uh, which is one of the main tourism spots for people to stop. And also the community of Asawas is, is very close by where people live full time. I'm um, just uh, wondering if there are any health concerns that there might be. I, good question, and, and the answer is no, there are no health concerns. So, uh, you know, first and foremost, uh, Industry Canada and Health Canada have a, a code for radiation and, and, and health concerns to do with uh, radar. Uh, so and this, is, this is well below that, uh, that threshold where they need to be concerned about that. And I, I talked to some, some of the engineers yesterday about how to communicate this in a way that people would understand and that, that even I could understand because I'm, I'm not a technical expert when it comes to this kind of uh, equipment. But he said, uh, for example, uh, it's putting out 20 watts of power, so less than a, than a regular sort of halogen light bulb in terms of power emittance. So, um, and of course, it's going uh, in an area that's secured, so people aren't sitting right next to it. Uh, like, for example, if you have your cell phone on you, your head all the time, and that certainly emits a lot more uh, uh, sort of radioactivity than than this would. And then he, we, we did test the site at Amphitrite Point in Euclid as well, and uh, apparently that site has uh, quite a bit more equipment there to do with uh, naval radar and different things. And and he said, you know, comparatively, this would be sort of a tenth or something of that sort of power and that sort of um, um, you know radioactive power, I guess. So when it comes to uh, the threat or the health risks, there, there are, are basically none. Um, yeah. Mm. And uh, one more, uh, more an observation, I guess. Um, uh, a locally generated earthquake or tsunami will have plenty of warning of. What, uh, what is more uncertain around here is, is tsunamis coming from remote earthquakes in mm -hmm. Japan or the Aleutian Islands or whatever. And uh, your system, once it's tuned up and operating, will be able to detect those as easily as, as any, any uh, locally generated one? That's right, yeah. So the, the, the distant sort of tsunami warning system is run by, by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, in Palmer, Alaska. And they're, they're pretty good at determining really far events. Um, it's a little bit more difficult when you have those sort of hour or two hour away events like Haida Gwaii was, uh, because it was uh, such an anomaly in terms of the location and and some of the information coming from that event. But for something coming from Japan in 2011, we had a lot of warning and a lot of idea of what was coming our way. Uh, and so we were able to prepare in those nine hours that we had before the, the Japanese tsunami came across. But you're right, this would be another data point for NOAA, and we're hoping that, and some of our bottom pressure recorders are currently giving data to NOAA. So to be able to say, you know, what does this data point look like? And certainly we hope that this will be another data point that they'll be able to ingest and then run through their models and say, what does this mean? If, if this is happening in Tofino or off the coast of Tofino, what does that mean for these communities that haven't seen the wave yet? And that's what the distance tsunami warning system is all about. It's, it's happened here, we felt the wave, or the, the shape, we're going to safety. What do our tide gauges and our bottom pressure recorders see, and our dark buoys see so that we can tell those people that haven't felt the shaking what's coming their way? And so, um, and so that will be done with this as well. So uh, again, to, to protect that whole Pacific basin from if, if we can tune it properly. <laughs> Could the high frequencies you're using do uh, does climatic changes such as fog affect your range at all? Good question. I, I don't think so. Uh, I don't know for sure. Uh, I know that, um, I, I don't believe it does. I know that it needs to connect with the ocean at a, at a very close point, so it can't be too far up a mountain, for example. And I know that uh, ocean salinity also affects it. So if there was a freshwater river coming in, uh, it wouldn't have the connectivity that the radar would need to, uh, to bounce off the surface. But I don't, I don't think fog would impact it, but I don't know that for certain. But I can get you that answer if you like. Yeah, because we do get a lot. We can get a lot of you fog, do, yeah. especially at Long Beach. So. Yeah, and, I, and I, I'd like to think that they've thought of that. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that they have, but uh, I don't know the, the, the certain answer for you, but I can get back to you on that one for sure. Okay. Councillor? Uh, when do you anticipate this will be up and running and will it be long term? Uh, yes, both to both. Uh, the first one, uh, when it will be up and running, we're working with BC Hydro to get the poles. We, we just um, got the, the permits for Industry Canada for the frequency range uh, because there are other people using frequency ranges near, near that frequency range. So. 
Uh, so we've got the go-ahead to turn it on. We just need the power to turn it on. So that's a couple of weeks before we can get the power pole and before we can get to, it to turn on. Uh, and then we start receiving that data. And from there, we can sort of start, uh, begin looking at that next phase, which is, again, taking that information and taking that data and putting out something of value that people can understand with those data points. So uh, that's still a bit to be determined. We, we have funding until the end of 2016, March 2016. So that's sort of the, the drop dead date that we have to come up with something by that date. Uh, so, and as far as long term, most of our installations are looking at about, we have average about 20 years, or we're looking okay. to, to sort of, that's the lifespan before you want new technology or you need to, to replace it with something else or before something gets rusted out. Uh, but certainly, uh, we're looking at long term, yeah. Okay. And, and the frequency is not, um, it's not based on, on uh, site, um, is it? Uh, I, I'm not sure I understand. Um, the, the installation, the antenna is always sending out a, a signal. Mm -hmm. uh, it isn't based on a, a line of sight? Uh, to a certain extent it is. So for example, um, with the transmit array, uh, where it's located, we might have to top some trees mm -hmm. so that it has a good sort of, it doesn't have any obstructions uh, to get to the, the sea and then you know, do its thing. The frequency does relate to how far that range is. Right. So uh, the higher the frequency, the shorter the range. The shorter the range, the, the better you can see sort of the, the details. So the farther out you go, the less details. And the closer in you go, the more details. So again, we tuned it to 13.3 or 13.5 to say, okay, we want about 80 kilometers to get out towards the continental shelf to be able to see a tsunami wave coming in. Now, if we tuned it a little bit higher, we would be able to get more detail closer in but the application is towards that further out tsunami, yeah. tsunami detection. So it does have a bit of tweaking that you can do to it depending on what your application is. Uh, and on also those frequencies are being used by, for example, uh, the Navy or whatnot. So you've got to make sure that you stay away from sure. interrupting their frequencies. So there's a bit of uh, engineering and science right. to it. But, uh, but we're thinking we're going to get some good range and also some good detail of what is uh, you know, going on in that sort of swath of area off of the coast. Okay. Well, thank you very thank much you. for taking the time to come out and inform us of what's going on. That's very much appreciated. You're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, but I understand <laughs> you want to go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And, uh, I appreciate your time. And, uh, and, yeah, I, and any questions that uh, you might have that come up, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. So feel free to contact me. Okay. Thank okay. you, Taryn. Thank you. All right. So next we're going to move to the business arising from the minutes. And Council will, will recall that two weeks ago at our last meeting, we received correspondence from the local resort association about water bills and we discussed uh, some of the background behind that around the changing of water meters and the misreading of water meters and the impacts that that's had on uh, bills and on the overall picture for Tofino's utility rates and the uh, reconsideration of those rates that we will be doing later in 2015. Council asked for more information and uh, to be kind of brought back up to speed on the way our utility uh, billing works. And so Nyla is here to make a presentation and then we'll continue our discussion. Thank you, Nyla. Thank you, Lauren and Council. Um, <clears throat> I apologize if I don't project my voice very well. I'm sick, so <laughs> if you can't hear me, just, just let me know and I'll do my best. <clears throat> so I'm, I provided a well, some detailed information, but I've also, I'm going to start with an overview of maybe, or sorry, a little bit of a background of, of how we arrived here um, and what prompted the request from the resort association um, and what the impacts would be of, of the request should it be approved by council. <coughs> So in 2014, staff determined two issues, two different types of issues with water meters in the hotel and motel rate class. Uh, two of the meters were reading decimal errors, um, and that meant that consumptions were reading at a tenth of what the actual consumption was. Two meters were malfunctioning, producing reads that were, that were too low, lower than what the actual consumption was. All meters in the hotel motel class since that time have been replaced with a new style of meter referred to as a magnetic meter. Prior to this time, all meters in the municipality were turbine meters, meaning they have moving parts. Over time, those moving parts can break down. Um, it's dependent on, on uh, 
use, age, there's, there's several factors that could cause that, um, or they could simply malfunction. <coughs> we move to a magnetic styling meter, which does not have moving parts. It reads the, uh, the consumption far more accurately. Um, since the meters have been switched out and going in and reviewing the data in that class and in other classes, no further issues or errors have been detected. <coughs> so I feel as though it's important to point out that in municipality, the district did not lose any revenue. And what I mean when I say that is that the current utility rates that we have, which were established in 2009, that was the last time they were amended, and each time utility rates are established, they are based on a revenue requirement that covers 100% of the cost of the service to provide water and to provide sewer. And then the, we work backwards from there and we establish rates. <coughs> the rates were determined on inaccurate consumption levels, not inaccurate revenue requirements. <coughs> So the impact of this error is as follows. The distribution of the rates and revenues between the classes likely would have differed. Um, staff can assume that the same rationales would have been applied to rate development. And due to the rationales used to develop the utility rates, an inequity between and within classes can be assumed currently. So inequities within the hotel motel class, within the commercial class, and then across classes as well, between residential, between hotel and motel. An example of a rationale that was used in the development of the rates is that the commercial class, at a certain level of consumption, would begin paying more for water um, than the residential class. That goes, sorry, for the commercial class and the hotel motel class. So we can assume as staff that those rationales would have been applied um, if, if we knew actual consumption or based on consumption that we used at the time. <coughs> I will provide a breakdown in a moment of the number of accounts by class, um, but to provide you with this information, there were four accounts in the hotel motel class that were being charged based on inaccurate consumption levels. That's four out of 29 in that class, and I'll provide more information on that in a moment. <coughs> In 2014, the district collected more water and sewer revenue than what was required to operate the utility services, meaning we collected more than what we budgeted for. <coughs> In quarter one of 2015, the district will continue to collect more revenue than budgeted for <coughs> in that quarter. Utility rates are currently under review with possible amendment in quarter three of 2015. <coughs> now for the numbers. <laughs> so, breaking the, I don't know if everyone has seen um, the bylaws that establish the water and utility rate, or sewer utility rates. But it's broken down, the rate structure is broken down into six classes. And then each class has five tiers. And so it's marginally charged for water, moving up the rate class based on consumption levels. The residential, we have a total of 793 utility accounts. The residential class accounts for the majority of those accounts. Um, they don't, however, account for the majority of consumption, but um, um, they do they do consume a significant amount of water in 669 accounts um, that class consumes 127,000 cubic meters of consumption and is billed 235,000 or was billed in 2014 235 before I go any further into the numbers I just want to point out that these all the numbers in the presentation today have not been audited and they are subject to change. Typically, we don't alter too much, but I just wanted to um, mention that. <coughs> the commercial class has 64 accounts. Um, what you typically see in the commercial class are all the restaurants, any businesses in town, just to give you an example, $92,000 in billing. 
institutional class, that would be um, hospital would be the school. Um, that accounts for the least amount of consumption overall. Uh, processing, there are only three accounts, and you can see that they consume a significant amount of water build out at 136,000. Hotel motel class, which is a class where we're, where we're seeing these errors, uh, there are 29 accounts. Four of those accounts, um, we've established that there, there were errors in consumption. <coughs> Hotel and hotel class accounts for the majority of it, or sorry, not the most amount of consumption, but they are billed the most amount. So you can see, as I was explaining earlier, um, there is a certain level where the hotel and hotel class begins to pay more for water than what the residential class would. Um, all the, as well, the residential class is spread over several accounts, so there's an opportunity to um, <coughs> for that build by amount uh, billed by class to come down. The strata class. <coughs> I'll start calling the strata class. Um, Sixteen unit, <coughs> sixteen accounts. Sorry, and yeah, build out at forty-eight thousand. So we collected seven hundred and seventy-two thousand dollars in revenue in two thousand and fourteen. And I'm just going to break that down a little bit in the next several slides. So we started with total water revenue. Or we collected total water revenue of 772000 Each year, we will see a increase in consumption or we'll see a decrease in consumption. It's always been around an average of uh, between 4 and 6% increase. <coughs> this year, based on an initial review and analysis, not saying this number is definite, um, we have, we're seeing a growth or increase in consumption of about 9%. And we established that number conservatively by removing the accounts that had errors, and then we looked at the remainder of, of the accounts to establish what that, what that growth or increase in consumption rate would be. So the difference between what the municipality collected in water in 2014 versus 2013 on those four accounts with errors was $67,000. 100% of that cannot be attributed to the errors in the water meters. We do need to apply a conservative amount of growth for that meter. And for the purposes of today's presentation, I've applied 9%. That number may change. We haven't done a thorough analysis. I was trying to get information back to council within two weeks. So just keep in mind that the number could change. But for the purposes of discussion, we would apply a growth rate. Um, which would reduce that that difference or additional revenue collected, which we can refer to it to refer to it as <coughs> by ninety two hundred dollars. So the total adjusted two thousand fourteen water revenue that was collected is seven hundred and fourteen thousand. The municipality budgeted six hundred and forty five thousand. So the additional water revenue collected in two thousand and fourteen, attributed to the errors in meters on those four accounts. Is um, comes down a little bit to fifty eight thousand five two seven. Later on in the presentation, we'll talk about what happens when a municipality collects more revenue than what is budgeted for, because we charge based on consumption. Um, we we just don't know to the penny what we're going to collect, so we have to put um, procedures in place to determine what would happen with those funds if we were to collect more. And that makes us accountable to the ratepayers. So this is the same slide as the last one, but we're talking about sewer revenue now. So sewer, sewer revenue is 90, we charge 90% of the rates for water for sewer, <laughs> that makes sense. So a lot of these, a lot of these, some of these numbers, when it comes to sewer, we've, we've estimated based on 90%. There are a lot of factors to, to consider. So these are subject to change. But for the purposes of today's discussion, I think they're they're more or less more or less accurate. Six hundred and ninety thousand dollars was collected in sewer revenue, and again, the difference between what's collected on those four accounts between two thousand fourteen and thirteen is sixty one thousand. Um, we then applied the nine percent consumption increase to adjust that amount, um, bringing the adjusted sewer revenue to six hundred and thirty eight thousand. We budgeted five hundred and eighty thousand and. So the additional sewer revenue collected, attributed to those four meters, is $52,000. And 
in the next slide, I put those two together. <coughs> so the additional revenue that the municipality collected, adjusting it for any increase in consumption, was 111250 in 2014. <coughs> Question on this slide? Sure. Well, on the last previous slides, I'm, I'm at a loss. The meters were under reading, mm -hmm. which means that we would have been, the consumption figures would have been low, which means, to my thinking, that the revenue would have been low, and yet you're talking about additional water revenue. Can you explain that? Yes. In 2014, we switched out the meters partway through the year yeah. on the four accounts. So two of the accounts, we um, actually, I believe, Three of the accounts we were able to charge the um, the higher or the charge based on actual consumption for two of the quarters, meaning we collected more revenue than we anticipated for, because we were basing our revenue revenue collection on the consumption prior to discovering the errors. Okay. Yeah, on one of the accounts, it was just for one quarter. Yeah. I sh thank you. I should have mentioned that at the beginning. <coughs> So that brings us to the request from the Resort Association, the West Coast Resort Association. Um, and they have requested that a temporary change to quarter two and quarter three rates remain at quarter one and quarter four rates while, water and sewer, while the water and sewer review is, uh, is taking place. So let me just go through what that would mean. Both sewer and water utility rate bylaws would require amendment if we were to keep rates at quarter one and quarter four. For those of you who don't know, um, utility rates in quarter one and quarter four are charged at what we call winter rates. For quarter two and for quarter three, the rates double and we refer to them as summer rates. <coughs> and that change occurred, um, seasonal rates as we refer to them as, were introduced in 2007. So the request is to keep the, the rates of quarter two and quarter three at the, at the winter rates. <coughs> if we were to do this, um, this would apply to all rate classes. We could not do it for the hotel motel class. Um, just to be, to be fair and to, to make an equitable decision, it would apply to all rate classes. So the revenue collection um, in quarter two and quarter three would be lower than in prior years, and I'll go into what that looks like in a moment. Um, an adjustment in quarter four 2015 billing would be required on all accounts to collect 100% of the revenue requirement for 2015. And that's what I'd like to go into now. So the financial impact of this request um, is, is based on some estimated numbers and then we compared them against what we actually collected in 2014. So in quarter two of 2015, we are estimating that we, <coughs> that we estimate that we would collect, if we kept ra rates at the winter rates, $143,000. That's based on current consumption levels <coughs> and <coughs> consumption levels. And we went back to quarter two of 2014 um, and what we're, what we're used to collecting in terms of cash flow and it was 242,000. So the difference in the revenue collection would be 99,700. When we estimated the quarter two of 2015, it is at that higher rate. So that provide, that allows for that difference to not be as large as we, as we would expect it to be, but there still is a $100,000 difference. Again, we'd see that on the sewer revenue side at about 90% of that. So the total cash flow shortfall or revenue shortfall, however you would like to refer to it, um, would be 189430 So that amount would have to be adjusted at the, at the end of quarter four if we were to continue to charge rates as we currently charge them because that's all I can base it on at this point. <coughs> and just for the for ease of, of looking at, I just rounded everything to the nearest hundred where I could. <coughs> so 
when I when I had a look at that difference, the hundred and eighty nine thousand, and I thought about how would we go about collecting it and 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 what impact that would have on account, I simply went in and had a look at proportionally what we collected by class and just split it across the board per account and what an what an average adjustment would be. I know in some in some cases or some classes that would be unfair. Um, this requires more attention, but just for the purposes of discussion, I. I thought this would be uh, interesting to look at. The residential class, on average, the residential class uses about 54 cubic meters per account. There's some anomalies, as there always are, but um, the adjustment would be $85 per account, and that is a typical um, quarter one or quarter four bill for a residential account. So if we deferred that to quarter four and adjusted that, Basically, in quarter four, the residents would be paying what they used to be paying in the summertime, or in quarter two or quarter three. Um, commercial class, again, it was just across the board, but there's there's definite inequities in there or by applying it this way because there's restaurants, but then there's small businesses that typically don't use a lot of water. It would be $355 per account, um, and so on and so forth. And where there will be definite um, inequities in the processing class, we have a large processing count, we have a smaller one. So we need to make some adjustments there. Hotel motel class, 2100 per account. <coughs> so what this essentially would do be doing, it would be deferring the, the payment that the account are used to be seen in the summertime, um, all accounts, and deferring that into quarter four. Bills would go out in January, and that's the time where that bill adjustment would, would take place. <coughs> And something to keep in mind is that the utility account transfers with property. If there were to be a transfer of property, that utility charge would go with the property. <coughs> then looking at quarter three on its own, this is the same analysis. Um, the total shortfall, if we were to apply the lower limits in quarter three, would be $318,000. what that would look like um, by class is this. It's, it's higher for sure. We collect about 75%, as I mentioned at the last meeting, of our revenues, our cash flow revenue requirement in the, in the two quarters, in quarter two and quarter three. So we definitely, from a cash flow perspective, see an impact. If we were to amend rates in quarter three, and council was favorable to um, no longer have any, having a seasonal rate, we'd have an opportunity to spread out um, what the charge would be over quarter three and quarter four of this year. That's assuming that the rates would be adjusted and that we would, we would no longer have a seasonal rate because we're seeing that charge on the highest levels of consumption, we're seeing the highest charge and right now under the current structure, and then we're seeing the lowest charge on the lowest levels of consumption. So making this adjustment in those quarters where we see the highest charge and highest consumption, it would be, it would be um, difficult to adjust that amount at the end of the year for some, for some rate payers. Mm -hmm. So just to put those two together, the last <coughs> column um, just adds those two adjustments together. So you can see the adjustment by it, and that's per account, and that's just an average. So for some, that looks quite significant, but as I mentioned, there are inequities. I think the most accurate one would be is the residential class, where they'd see an adjustment, if we did it over for both quarters, of $228, which is just not plus what they would re be regularly charged for water and quarter for, and that's quite significantly higher. Um, for a residential rate payer than what, they're not, what they would normally see, even in the summertime. So just to go back a little bit to talk about the that additional amount of revenue we saw and what was collected in 2014 and what we anticipate we collect in 2015, <coughs> if we were to keep budget numbers as they are. Um, and rates as they were. 
In 2014, we collected, as I mentioned before, an additional $111,000. <coughs> if we were to not think about this uh, error in consumption for a moment and just talk about an increase in, uh, in consumption of, say, 6% in a year, the uh, additional revenue that was collected in that year, and if any money um, remains unspent at the end of the year, um, the municipality has a bylaw, bylaws 873 and 874, one is for water, one is for sewer, which establish reserve funds, statutory reserve funds. And the surplus, any unspent amounts in that year, must be transferred into that, into that reserve fund and then spent for the purposes of whatever they are established in the bylaw. And I can tell you off the top of my hand that those are capital and infrastructure related expenditures. So, um, with that bylaw being established, the additional revenue collected in 2014 would be transferred into that reserve fund. The additional revenue that we anticipate to collect in quarter one of 2015, which is estimated to be at 30,000, with a, with a conservative estimate of what the growth in, in consumption would be. <coughs> This amount, we have an opportunity to offset that adjustment that would be required in the last quarter, should council choose to do so. Um, if it remains unspent at the end of the year, then it would go into the reserve fund. But throughout the year, there's an opportunity to decide where those funds go. If we were to use that 30,000 additional revenue that would be collected in quarter one, the total adjusted shortfall, so we, we've added here in this slide the quarter two and quarter three shortfall, then it would come to 507,000. Adjusting it for the 30,000 in additional revenue collected, it would be an adjusted shortfall of 477,000. And that's for water and for sewer. So the shortfall will be 38% of utility revenues based on a revenue requirement of a 2% increase over 2014 budget. <coughs> so to summarize, holding winter rates for quarter two and quarter three for all rate classes, will it, it will significantly impact the billing for all customers for quarter four 2015 billing. If we adjust it just for quarter two, we'd basically be seeing a shift of that seasonal rate into quarter four, rather than seeing it in quarter two, for the majority of the accounts. Revenue collected in quarter three and quarter four, as I mentioned, is typically 75% of what we require. So we'd be looking at, you know, not only a, um, deferring that payment, for you, for rate players, we'd also see the impact from a cash flow perspective of potentially up to $500,000. <coughs> By maintaining winter rates for quarter two and quarter three, 41% <coughs> of water and sewer revenue will require collection, in addition to what is regularly billed into in quarter four. Okay, I think that's all I have on that. Okay, thank you, Nyla. That was very methodical, and I appreciate that. Okay. So I'm gonna ask, I'm sorry, JJ, we don't accept questions from the audience at this point. I'm gonna ask council um, if you have, first of all, any, any questions of clarification around numbers or the technical aspects of the presentation before we discuss the letter. Is there anything that was unclear or any questions you have about numbers or any slides you want to see again. Councilor Fitt. Yes, thank you for that and thank you for the extra work that it took to put all of that together. Thank you. Um, it's a pretty obvious question, um, but I'm just wondering, the obvious, is there nothing in our computer system which would raise a red flag when these discrepancies have been noted, and, and if so, why wasn't this discrepancy <coughs> noted before last <coughs> September? 
Well, I don't have a perfect answer for that. Um, um, I mean, I, in a perfect world, there would be zero discrepancies. Um, we have um, we have a very manual, a very manual system with respect to utility reports being printed out and our ability to to compare those 800 accounts from quarter to quarter to quarter. Um, we we often find discrepancies when it comes to water leaks. Um, either it's noted from the resident or we find it before the bill goes out. So we do have processes in place for that. Um, what this has done is improved those processes. We've taken it a step further and we've tried to find ways to compare that manual data. Um, unfortunately, no, there's nothing in our, in our software that would have given us a red flag saying that those are inaccurate. Um, what it did, because it was on four major hotel motel accounts, it brought the, um, it skewed those numbers. I mean, we could, we could take all those accounts and compare them against one another, but with some of them reading slightly lower, some of them reading quite a bit lower, it was, we were comparing against inaccurate numbers to see what an average hotel and motel would use. As well, the services at each hotel and motel provider are, are different. Some have restaurants, some do not. Some have more rooms, some do not. Some have campgrounds, um, as we've come to realize, use quite a bit of water, and some do not. So it, it's it's very difficult to compare to compare the accounts. Um, and yes, in a perfect world, I wish that I found this on my first day five years ago, but I, I didn't, and we didn't. Um, but we found it now, and. I think that we need to look for and find a way to improve our processes so that we don't see this happen again. Thank you. Councillor McMaster? So you're saying this is, I mean, you said, you know, you joined five years ago, so this could have been growing on longer than five years? In some, in, with some of the accounts, yes, it was. Okay. Yeah. Um, my next question is <coughs> when. When we got the 2012 water report, that gave some indi indications of some discrepancies with the data that was presented, not the actual report itself. Uh, I think that was a bit of an indication there was something wrong. And did we replace the water meters at the fish processing plants? Yes. Are we seeing a difference there now? No. Um, the the difficulty with those accounts, though, is they use they use drastically different amounts of water from quarter to quarter and from year to year within those quarters. So on, on any other account, with the exception of processing, we can look back what someone used in quarter two in one year versus a prior year and prior year, and you'll see that to, to be quite even. With processing accounts, we just we do not see that. So we haven't seen a drastic jump. We haven't seen consumptions above what we would normally see in a year or over a few years. So no. So getting back to that, can you go look back in the accounts of the resorts and see if there was a 900% jump? And we actually don't see that in, in a few of the accounts. So what, what we did in, two, oh, I, I don't want to guess on the year, but I will. I think it's 2003, 2004. We moved from uh, measuring in imperial gallons to cubic meters. So when that occurred, there was one issue with one of the accounts because a meter was also switched out at that time. Um, but no, there's no sort of significant up and then down. So some one meter was installed and it was malfunctioning right from right from the start. <coughs> so this yeah, it has been on the pain since 2003 then. In or some cases, that was that was happening. Yeah. And my other thought is um, everybody's, you know, <coughs> if we were to adopt this and everybody's <coughs> bill going up in Q4, Q4 is a pretty bad time for most residents. Uh, a lot of residents aren't working, they've got Christmas and they've got tax bills paying. I don't think that would sit very well for people that, you know, basically have been able to offset their water bills against their taxes. This business expense. Any other questions for Nyla? I mean, I'm sure we'll, we, as we discuss this, I think we might have more questions for you, but I don't want to make you stand throughout our entire discussion. So, any other questions for Nyla right now? 
Councilor Are all the meters now? I, last year there was a change in meters for, for residences, was it? Last year or the year before? No. Since we have discovered this error, um, and I think through discussions with council, the decision's been made to switch out all the meters to uh, um, with mag magnetic meters, replace them all with turbine meters. Even the new residential units that have been built since, or that have been, um, or new meters, where new meters have been installed, they've been, they've received magnetic meters. So it, there is a, there is, a, there will be a program in place to switch them all out, but no, 100% of them have not been switched out for magnetic meters. We, we changed from a, a manual read to a radio read, right? Yes, several years ago. Yeah, yes. three years ago. Yeah, but that didn't affect the type of meter. Or it did not affect. It was a no. It was a, oh. an addition to the existing meter. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <coughs> right. yeah. I. You know, I've, I've mentioned this before. I'm reminded of people saying, "Well, why didn't you tell me?" And you know, it's well, I am telling you. You know, like <laughs> when is that point? You know that you know and and you find out and so forth, and, and it, it, ha it is when it happens. If you, if you had known this for two years and not shared it, you know, in proceeding budget, that's a different thing. But it was discovered, it was dealt with, that's what happened. And, and I commend staff for finding and discovering these problems when and as they occur, because, you know, the issue of, of payment of water has been a very um, concerning one for residents and we've looked at various scenarios and one of the uh, concerns is a fair playing field. The, what I'm trying to understand in looking at these numbers, when you talk about the increase in a quarter um, for the class of resorts and so forth, it looked like it was like about $5,000 across the class or to... Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, um, their hotel, motel, what was that? Um, this is quarter for adjustment mm -hmm. would be $36.29 per all 29 units, or? Yes, per account. Yeah, okay, so. <clears throat> per quarter four. In quarter four, and, and you know, I, I'm just trying to understand, I, I understand their bill is larger than that, and that there would be this adjustment, but, and, and, there, and what I've heard from the resorts is their intention is that they, they understand that 100% will be paid in the year. They just want it to be paid differently. But in terms of cash flow, I, I, I'm perplexed. And maybe I don't know where information comes from. But you know, in my own operations, I like to pay everything in quarter. You know, what would be quarters two and three because that's when there actually is cash flow. So I I just don't understand this and you know the request. In fact unless I'm not understanding what something about the amounts of money we're talking about. Okay. Have a seat. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nyla. Um, and, I mean, we, Council had asked for more information. Nyla has presented us with that information. We have a letter before us, which we take at face value. And our purpose now is to discuss the letter and discuss the request. I think, I hope that everybody has a full understanding of what the implications are if the letter was followed through uh, by applying Q1 rates through Qs 2 and 3 and then having to adjust in Q4 for that. And there have been a couple of expressions already um, and we'll just keep going. So Councillor Anderson, um, go ahead. I'd just like to thank Nyla for the presentation that was um, put together really well in a fairly short time. So. Uh, my take on it is similar to what has already been expressed, that, um, that the impact will, will hit all rate classes. And I think the ability of, of some, like the, the resort people who are really interested in this and put forward the solution, I think it's, they'll get their head around it and be able to understand why it's happening and prepare for it. But for everyone else across in all rate classes, they'll, they'll look at their quarter one, quarter two, and three billings come in and probably be happy that they're fairly low and probably not may not even be aware that this is coming in quarter four. Um, and then they'll be they'll be hit 
what I understand is 41% of their whole annual use on that one bill. And um, again, at a time when cash flow for most people <coughs> is quite low. So I just, just given the fact that that it, that it is applied across all, all classes, and I think the, the ability for people to, to understand why that's happening is, is, is limited and to the amount of interest they have in, in following it all. So I, I really can't support meeting the request. I'll move, help me deny the request. Okay. Second. All right, so it's moved and seconded. The motion on the floor then is to deny the request. Some discussion, any further discussion? Councillor? Uh, just one question to be clear. Um, I'm not sure that I got this from the staff presentation, but I just want to be clear that this was noted in September of 2014. Is that, is that clear? It was made known uh, to the resorts that this error occurred? Was it now six months? It was, it was May 2014. We're speaking aware um, of the decimal error, okay. and we spoke with those two resorts within days of knowing those. I think as the readers have changed out, the discussions yeah. have gone on. Yeah, and and then so um, <coughs> the discussion with the one with the resort that was not a decimal error was about you know, paying about a third. Um, that was discovered some weeks or months later. And again, as as they were discovered. That Okay. So, on, based on that and the, and the research that I've done, I also feel it is clear that this community cannot support this request. And um, as to the discrepancies between hotels and between meters and old meters, I have a lot more questions and answers that I still want to discuss. But as for this request, I would also vote in favor of the motion. And I think, as council knows, that this is cut the, the the question of utility rates altogether is coming back to this council in this year. So there will be more discussion about how uh, water and sewer rates are applied across classes, within classes, between seasons, etc. Any other comments or questions, discussion on the motion? <coughs> Councilor Burke? Uh, just that uh, because it is such a concern in the community and that it is coming up that if people have uh, since, especially after this presentation and how things are laid out, that please talk to your counselors. Please talk to, uh, you know, uh, bring your concerns forward uh, so we're aware as we go into that discussion. Mm -hmm. That's all. Okay. All right, then I'll call the question. All in favor of the motion? Thank you. Motion carries. All right. So, moving on then in our agenda, uh, announcements from the mayor. I have none today. And we'll move into correspondence for information only. <coughs> and our first item is from a uh, local resident, Catherine Haas, regarding a crosswalk at Hallison Drive. So I, a couple of things I want to point out for <coughs> Council. First of all, we have had a request in the past for um, a crosswalk at Hallison Drive. We've had several requests at different locations. <coughs> Lynn Road, that one went in, U Road, uh, New Street, that one um, is sort of in an in-between situation where uh, count, counts would need to be undertaken there to verify that the need exists according to the BC Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure has a pedestrian control crossing uh, policy book manual which is tens and tens of pages long. But last October, um, the ministry did provide us with this map and it's shown up on the screen here and it shows possible locations where a crosswalk could be installed where it meets the sight line requirements and places where we know that a crosswalk could not be installed because it simply doesn't meet the ministry's requirements or criteria. So two of those locations are right at Industrial Way where we know the corner that's approached as you're driving south and the second one is right at Hallison Drive, exactly where this request exists. And that is due to the dip, the corner, and the dip in the road. Uh, mostly it's due to the corner and the dip in the road as you're driving south. <coughs> the only way to solve that problem in the long run would be to completely redo the section of the road and, uh, and uh, 
fill in the dip and realign, realign the road a bit within the right of way, which is not something that's going to happen anytime soon in my opinion. Therefore, the request just can't be supported. Um, and I have left a telephone message for the letter writer and I'm very willing to follow up with her as well to provide more information as to why uh, the ministry has already determined that this isn't a proper location for a crosswalk. That is why the correspondence appears in for information only. But if you choose, we can do, we can handle it differently. Councillor McMaster? I mean, I'm just thinking back in Calgary, is there any opportunity for a pedestrian overpass? I mean, in Calgary, some of the pedestrian overpasses are built of wood. So, but you know, they're not that expensive a structure. Mm -hmm. That's a question that could be asked. Well, that's, I don't yeah, know the answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Councillor Thick. Um, and the, my question is, the letter that was printed in the paper, um, in, this, on, in regards to the same issue, addressed to mayor and council. Mm -hmm. Did it ever come to the mayor and council for discussion? Not that I'm aware of. I checked with staff. I, ne I didn't receive it, and it wasn't that we know of, that I know of right now, it was never emailed or, or delivered. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure. Councillor Burke? Well, I've uh, wondered in the interests of uh, road safety if another approach in the meantime is to um, look at ways to minimize um, traffic usage in that area. So right now, um, Halston Drive comes out of Ocean Park <coughs> and so forth and onto the highway. Mm -hmm. And I've wondered about actually blocking that off as a turning point or as a roadway access just reducing traffic. People are going to pass there, but at least... I'm not way. sure I totally understand. So how the t changing traffic patterns that would then for therefore impact the pedestrian crossing ability? Well, there, there's, there can't apparently be a pedestrian crossing Correct. there, but right. I'm just wondering if we can look at ways to kind of minimize uh, traffic flow. So that was just one right. thought. Okay. The second is um, to service that kind of area, um, if um, a crossing at Mackenzie Road would mm -hmm. be appropriate. Mm -hmm. So yeah. feedback from the ministry on that has been that yes, it meets a criteria, but with no public access at the end of Mackenzie mm -hmm. Road, it's um, that's the issue that's right. been identified. Yeah. <coughs> Bob? Yeah. Your Worship, sorry for being a little bit slow here. If I can get back to Councillor Thick's question about a, a letter. Yes. We did receive a letter last week after the deadline, after the council package was, was put together. Okay. So I think it came in on Thursday. So okay. um, I'm not sure what was in the what was in the, the newspaper, but that may be. Uh, there's a letter that we'll, we'll council will get. To oh, okay. Next agenda. It'll be on the next agenda. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for well, the confusion. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, because I thought, well, it was printed, so why didn't we receive it also at the same time? But that's okay. Um, I'm also thinking about how else we can protect um, people and minimize this problem. And I, I like Council McMaster's suggestion, or could there be an underpass? Like, what are some other things that we could maybe consider in light of, you know, quite a few requests for this, <coughs> even though the ministry doesn't um, see fit? That, that this crosswalk could see could be fit in this place, and I'm also wondering, you know, sometimes at at um, community hall meetings, we we wonder why we don't have enough people. Well, you know, a topic such as this could, such as crosswalks or or illuminating this to the general public, could this be some place where we had perhaps a little fuller discussion, and people could also <coughs> express their opinion and perhaps there would be a new or different resolution to the problem. Suggestion, that's all. Thank you. Um, I understand that well, transport doesn't support the notion of a crosswalk, but uh, I'm just wondering if we know if, if there's other options, like just people are going to cross there whether there's a crosswalk or not. Mm -hmm. So it's not the safest situation but could there be warning signs that people are crossing the highway at, at all kinds of points, not just there? 
Mm. Um, there, there must be a safer and, and option, even if the crosswalk option is not mm -hmm. available, um, than just simply crossing without any notification to drivers. Or I'd like to check into that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who's, who's crossing? <laughs> so screwed up. That's true. So maybe a motion to refer to staff to follow up with the ministry about any possible alternatives or mm -hmm. yeah. suggestions? Yeah, I'd like, I'd suggest I'd like to make that motion. Alternatives. alternatives to this. What about the residents? Are, what, what other suggestions might they have? <coughs> If, this, if a crosswalk can't be there, what could be there, as to Councillor Anderson's suggestion? Okay. Somebody wish to make a motion? Okay, I'll move to uh, refer the letter to staff to explore all options available with the Ministry of Transportation. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Any final discussion on that? Clear. Maybe just to add the words yeah. in regards to pedestrian safety. Okay. Is that all right with everybody? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Is it clear to staff the motion? Okay. Thanks, Elise. All right. Then I'll call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Motion carries. Our next letter is correspondence from Mike Dauphiny regarding dog feces, a problem that um, obviously is in the uh, of concern to several local residents because we are receiving quite a few letters about it. Uh, there is another one that will appear on our agenda for the next council meeting as well that came in after the deadline for this meeting. So, your discussion direction, Councillor Anderson. Um, the area that is uh, brought up in the letter, mm -hmm. being down by First Street Dock, um, I'm wondering, do we have uh, dog disposal bags there? Is, there? is that in place there? And maybe I'd like just to hear what, I, I know we've sort of um, tried to increase the number of, of sites that we have doggy disposal bags um, and uh, maybe garbage cans too in some cases, but I'm, I'm just wondering how that is going and if this Places targeted for okay for that. Good question. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know that it, I don't believe that we have the bag dispenser there. We do have some more bag dispensers on the way, so you know, this feedback that we're getting mm -hmm. um, that might be a good. Sounds like it's a good location for, for, for one of the ones that we're mm -hmm. putting up in the future. Um, so I don't believe that Secondly, with respect to to the issue of garbage cans that came up with the council I think two meetings ago. Um, we're looking into that. We think we found a relatively cheap solution that uh, we're going to try on a sort of a pilot program. So um, there's a dispenser and can at Ocean Park, so something similar to that. That's a small can and a little um, um, jerry rig it so that you can't put household garbage in it, so that it only has a small opening somewhere, and so that we don't have a picnic garbage being found in there. We'll try that in a couple of locations and see how it goes, and if, if we have good compliance, we'll um, um, be able to expand in that. Um, but if any councils are there, we, we don't want to replace one problem on another. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councillor uh, Just to follow up on that, um, the, I, I think it's safe to say that that staff is sort of aware and working on the problem, but I'm, so I don't know if a motion is really required. But. Uh, uh, well, I'll just point out that the letter writer does specifically ask some questions of mayor and council mm -hmm. around bylaw enforcement. Mm -hmm. So, in my opinion, we should be responding to the questions that the letter writer is asking. And I'd ask you how you feel is the most appropriate way to do that. Yeah. Councilor Blanchett? Um, well, it came up at a previous council meeting that uh, that uh, the bylaw provides no off-leash areas anywhere within the district. And, uh, and also, I was looking at the bylaw uh, earlier today. It, it states that uh, dog owners must clean up 
uh, feces after their pets. Mm -hmm. But it seems to provide no penalties for that. Um, the only penalties mentioned in the Animal Control Bylaw uh, licensing regulation are impound fees of 50, 100, 200, and 300 dollars for repeated offenses. Um, we did, at that previous meeting, send the uh, bylaw uh, back to staff for some reconsideration. And uh, I could maybe ask staff, through your worship, where, where that stands right now and whether there is something we can do to, uh, to in particular, address the dog feces problem through that bylaw. Thank you. Uh, your worship, maybe to sort of answer the bigger question first. Um, this is not a problem that's unique to to, to Kingdom. Uh, if, if someone has decided they're not going to clean up after their dog, if they're going to let their dog you know, defecate wherever it chooses and not clean it up, um, I don't know that a bylaw that has different words in it than the one that we have now is really going to solve that. Um, it's, to me, it's more of a social issue than a bylaw, than a bylaw issue. Um, we, uh, and I think the council understands that we, we can only enforce that component of the bylaw if our one bylaw officer, who's a you know, point eight position of a, of a bylaw enforcement, catches a dog in the act. Um, the chances of that, I think, you can appreciate, are pretty remote. Um, that said, you know, as we find dogs that are at large or are off leash, um, uh, the bylaw enforcement officers do address that. Um, in, in terms of um, some of the requests that came from council, when that bylaw will be back, I don't have an answer for you now. We have several bylaws that are under review that we want to get to council. This is this is one of them. Thank you, Councilor Burke. Yeah, thank you. Um, in reading this, you know, and I think uh, with what our CAO has said about it being a social problem, um, I I quite agree. Uh, although I do think there are tools in bylaw and bylaw enforcement to um, assist. I think the stronger thing is to kind of message it within the community. I, it, to me, it's an issue in part about community pride mm -hmm. and personal responsibility. And um, you know, we do. Um, when when there was the water crisis, um, uh, Tours and Tofino and the district worked really well together in uh, messaging uh, about the expectation. You know, don't let your tax drip or whatever it was. It was really uh, a well presented message um, that, and I think some of the um, cards are, are still around saying, you know, we conserve water and so forth. Whether now in the way things played out, <laughs> as according to our water usage, and that, you know, maybe neither here nor there, but I, there was a real awareness that was created and it, a sense of personal responsibility. And I think we could be looking at something along those lines again around this issue of community pride. What kind of place, you know, do you want to live in? This is what we will do. Help us achieve this uh, community <coughs> that you know that we all want to live in. I know when I, before I came uh, to to Fino, I, I lived in False Creek, and it was disgusting. It was so out of control. I, I really didn't want to live there. It, it, it has that kind of effect, you know. You just feel that there's a contamination, uh, you know, your children are subjected to and so on and so forth that's un, un, unmanaged. And uh, really, I don't want to see Tofino uh, residents feeling that way about, um, about walking along sidewalks that are already, you know, you actually have to really pay attention where you're walking, you know, when you're walking on the sidewalk. So if there are things like this to see, it's, it stands out a little more. Anyway, I'm going on and on a bit, but I think within our water bills or something, there could be um, uh, something uh, put forward. So depending on how this discussion goes, I won't make a motion right now, but I'll, I'll um, perhaps look to crafting something and bring it back. Okay, thank you. Councillor Thurgood? Um, council is aware of the number of letters we're getting and the concerns from the public is you're quite vocal in this matter. Um, has our bylaw enforcement, our one bylaw enforcement officer, uh, been made aware of 
the concerns of the citizens of the community. Um, I think that's where we should be starting as well, is, is to, uh, um, if a dog is, yeah, yeah, uh, I think a bylaw enforcement officer should be made aware uh, mm -hmm. that it is coming to council mm -hmm. every couple of weeks and uh, see what, uh, what input he could have to it or effect he could have on it. Okay, I know that Jane has some answers to that already. Go ahead. Certainly, <coughs> uh, Mr. Vess is aware of these complaints and he uh, will follow up with people. Uh, sometimes, and it's very helpful, if people complain directly to him as well. And so he contacts the complainants. He lets them know what they need to do to gather evidence, uh, including dog licenses. Uh, we have issued tickets for not picking up feces. So, um, Councillor Blanchett, I'm not sure you, I believe you said that you thought that there was no um, penalties or None that I could see in the uh, There are actually in the another bylaw. Nice they, they appear in the, in the bylaw notice and adjudication. Okay. So, yeah, and we have issued tickets as well as we go with the um, He still so informed me that we are putting in um, more stations to pick up the bags, as well as there's new signage coming, because that's part of the education as well, so that people know that it's their responsibility to pick up after their dog. Thank you, Jane. Um, this is just an intuition on my part, but um, I would guess that that a good part of the uh, dog feces problem comes from dog roaming at large. If somebody has a dog on a leash and the dog is doing its business, it's pretty evident and pretty obvious. And uh, so, uh, certainly, a dog roaming at large is an easier thing for a bylaw officer to catch than a dog actually doing its business. And I wonder if we might approach this by, by upping the bylaw enforcement on dogs roaming at large. But that does uh, catch us in the, in the fact that uh, according to our current bylaw, there is nowhere in the district that a dog can roam at large. There's no, no off-leash area. Um, de facto, there are many off-leash areas in practice, Chesterman Beach being the, the premier one that I've seen. Um, so if we designate off-leash areas, then maybe we can uh, be a little more proactive in grabbing dogs uh, that are roaming at large, not in the off-leash areas, and that might help with the dog feces issue. Thank you. We have another issue, which is that we have nowhere to put dogs once they are grabbed, being off leash. Mm -hmm. So I think you make a really good suggestion that it is easier to deal with the off leash issue than it is to deal with catching a dog in the act and then ticketing its owner. Um, and if this is a, a, a course of action that council wishes to pursue, there are some implications to this that we should seriously discuss. And I know we're not going to discuss everything and make a decision today, but I ask you, is this the discussion you want to have if the District of Tofino wants to go down this path of um, determining some uh, off-leash areas, whether it be seasonal or time of day or place, and the consequence of having to have uh, impounding ability and, and the, the, what's associated with that in terms of resources. And we accept that when the community has certain expectations and we feel it's in the best interest of everyone that we talk to the community about resourcing our staff and our, um, all of the equipment and everything that's needed to meet those expectations. It's a worthwhile conversation. I'll put it to you, is this, is this a conversation we want to have? Yes, Councilor Thurgood. Uh, this might be a good topic or one of the topics that tomorrow, tomorrow evening Beat, all be. They will be. Let's hear from the public, uh, more from the public, mm -hmm. ideas, and our thoughts and their thoughts. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow night's public <coughs> town hall meeting does is about bylaw enforcement, and although the presentation will be about the program in general, there certainly will be uh, opportunity for right. small table discussion, and this might, for those that are interested in this topic, we can strike a small table just to discuss it. it no, no problem there. I saw hands. Sorry, Councillor Anderson? 
Um, I, I'm aware that the, the idea of a off-leash area for dogs did come before council at, at one point, mm -hmm. and it was a fairly short discussion. But um, if, if you if you pick an area, no matter where it is, as being the, the off-leash location, of course it has impacts on the, the people that live or do business and in that area, so um, moving the problem or focusing the problem in one area has those impacts on, on those people. So that's why it was sort of just left the way it was without establishing an off leash area. Being aware that you're, you're concentrating a problem in one area or potentially doing that. So it, it, that's, although notionally it, it seems like a, a good idea, it does have its impacts on, on those that, that use a specific area. That, so that, I just want to make everyone aware that that has been discussed before. Not to say that it shouldn't be discussed again, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a diff, this is a really, I find this a really difficult problem because it's, I don't believe myself that it's up to government to go around and pick up behind your dogs. It's really a responsibility that if you are a dog owner, you should take on yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I, I, th I think the problem would get worse, say, if, if not with, with fining and so on, but if the, the more we take care of that problem, clean up behind them, provide dog bags, the less responsibility the community feels they have to take care of that themselves. And so I, I'm really I'm really torn on this one, but it's also, I don't feel it's our job to go around and, and be the nanny and, and, and tell people what, what to do with their dogs. There should be a, a level of responsibility and knowledge when you own a dog um, that there, there's some things that, that go along with it. And I, I, I kind of, I, I resent the fact that somehow it's government's job to solve this problem, and and that, and the fact that people that own dogs can't take care of it themselves. So, um, having said that, we <laughs> we may have to go down that road. Thank you, Councilor Anderson. Councilor McMaster, and then Councilor Pitt. Uh, I support Council Burt's approach for education on civic pride because I think, aside from dog poop, there's more issues for this town regarding civic pride. So I think we, I think as uh, a district, we should be having sort of a civic pride publicity PR campaign as to what we expect, not only from the visitors but also from the people that live here. And I think we should. We need to get our heads together to work out what we want to do. And I think whatever we do, whether it goes in water bills, displayed in B and B's, restaurants, whatever, I think that would really help. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, I agree about all that in the long term, and I, I think we talked about that two weeks ago as well. And everything from our own website to what what's being talked about in the ambassador program to Piers and Tofino, all these different avenues of, of public approach, but what Mr. Dauphiné is asking us today is this is a letter of complaint. We are operating on your complaint-driven system, and I think we owe him some sort of an answer. And I, I think the only thing I can think about in the short term is Mr. Councillor Thurgood's um, suggestion is could we write to him and ask him if he would be willing to speak to this at the public meeting tomorrow? as a short term, uh, because I do think that this, um, you know, it's been a recurring theme um, in the last few weeks. So I'd kind of like to have a little bit of public input on what to do, but I agree that the long-term um, solution is what we need to really work on. Thank you. I just want to make one clarification in what you said, that yes, we have a, there is a complaint-driven bylaw enforcement mm -hmm. system. But this letter is to Mayor and Council, so this is not an official bylaw complaint. In order for that to happen, Mr. Dauphiné would need to lodge a complaint with the staff. But you are correct. He has written a letter to Mayor and Council, and I agree it deserves a response. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I do think that 
uh, an invitation to attend tomorrow night is a, is a good response, and I am very willing to email him on behalf of council to let him know that that invitation exists. I have no idea if he can make it or not. Further to that, we, you know, to have more conversation um, or to write a letter and, and uh, that describes in general the type of conversation here. I think um, the, there's a lot to think about and what I'm hearing is that a staged approach is probably wisest. So the first item is around more education and continuing to address the problem spots with putting in bag dispensers and appropriate garbage receptacles, but a sense of community pride, building that through some education and messaging from the District of Tofino, be it on the website, through water bills, other ways of reaching people. Mm -hmm. But that it takes, it takes time to do this and that we all need to put some thought to that and hear back from the public. So I, I, I know that it's frustrating for letter writers and for people sometimes to see what they feel is inaction or they didn't make a decision today. But I think that to make a good decision and to chart the best course of action forward with respect to dogs especially, it's going to require some serious thought and, and careful consideration that's going to take a little bit of time to do it well. And if this continues to be raised by the community and council continues to be interested, they could see us going down that path. So for now, my suggestion would be that uh, we write back to Mr. Dauphiny with a letter that encapsulates some of this some of this conversation as well as makes extends mm -hmm. an invitation to attend tomorrow night. Okay. <laughs> 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 I'll let Councilor Fig move that. Councilor Blanchett seconds. Um, and so I don't understand what the motion mm -hmm. is. Yeah. The motion would be to write a letter for mayor and council to write a letter, and I'm going to put this on us, not on staff. If you're okay with that, and I'm happy to draft the letter um, to re reply to Mr. Dauphiny with uh, um, explaining some of council's um, considerations around uh, dog issues and, and vile enforcement issues regarding dogs the steps that we are taking to address some of these issues, that the district is taking to address some of these issues, and to invite him to attend the town hall meeting tomorrow night. Councilor Thurgood? Uh, he's <coughs> not going to get the letter. Sorry, Sorry to board to him. Email. Oh, email. I'll, I'll, the invitation I can, we can certainly send. The letter will take a day or two. Uh, I, I don't see why we don't just take this letter and, and refer it to uh, to uh, bylaw enforcement officer of vets. We can also do that. Thank you. <coughs> can we add that? Would you mm -hmm. be receptive to I that? think that's a different motion, okay. so let's just All deal right. with this one and then we'll, we can also refer it. And then Mr. Letts can also follow up. Councillor Benchett? Um, Mr. Dauphiny's principal question is this, by, uh, this bylaw is not enforced, i.e., the dog feces bylaw. Could you explain why not? Um, are we going to explain to him that it is in fact enforced but on a complaint driven basis, a particular you know, specific complaint driven basis? Can do that and certainly we can work with staff to, um, to make sure that the letter has accurate information about how the bylaw enforcement system works right now. Would that be fair? Yes, and it's proactively enforced during the summer months from mid May to mid September. May I also suggest then that we that we include the larger picture, such as Councillor Barrick was, was talking about? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So. Okay. Any final discussion? Everybody clear on the motion? Okay. I'll call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Motion carried. And now Councillor Thurgood, oh, you would like to move to refer this to the bylaw enforcement officer? Yes. Okay. That's it. That's Thank my motion. You. Thank you. Uh, seconded by Councilor McMaster. Any discussion on that? Councilor McMaster. One other thought mm -hmm. is that um, I was proactive during the summer months. Mm -hmm. Why not be proactive uh, on issues like this um, in the quiet months uh, now so that our local residents who are probably the biggest offenders um, are are aware that he has the time then mm -hmm. to do those things, and that uh, the locals then become aware 
and uh, are more pro uh, they have become more proactive mm -hmm. that rather than us um, being proactive on, on issues like this uh, when there are other more serious uh, issues uh, to deal with um, in the in the busy months it, it just makes to me it makes more sense when it's quiet and you see minor offenses I, I consider them minor uh, minor offenses um, if you see them in the quiet much you could be more responsive to it uh, rather, rather than having to wait for complaints to come in and, and uh, you know, if, if he's out there and sees them, he can take action. He doesn't have to ticket anybody, he can, but he can at least verbally speak with the person uh, or, uh, yeah, it just to me, to be proactive in the, in the off season is, is uh, equally as important as, as during the summer months. Even more so because he had he had more time. I know there's only one person, but at least he had more time to uh, to uh, pay attention to some of these issues that are coming before us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify. We had a presentation um, from uh, Director of Corporate Services on on um, bylaw and um, what has been done in the past and what have been the priorities that council might consider. I presume we're having uh, another discussion about considering bylaw priorities following the town hall meeting because we're, we're having some input from the community on that and then we hopefully would, would bring that back as part of our considerations in setting priorities, is that correct? Uh, I think, I'm sure there's always an opportunity to do that. I think the intention was, it's certainly to get feedback from the public during the meeting, it, which may or not, may, may identify issues that we're simply not aware of. I think the general thought is that the summer program issues are consistent every year and they aren't anticipated to change greatly, but that's always open for discussion and it's at council's discretion. Because mm -hmm. yeah. one of the things that did come up was the possibility of, um, you know, as, as having an intensification of a certain focus area mm -hmm. at different times so that, you know, um, over the course of the bylaw season, a number of areas are handled, but, you know, with an intensification that sets out the message and so forth that maybe uh, diffuses mm -hmm. um, over time. Just Certainly a thought, it's thought that I'm hoping we'll, we'll have a chance to talk mm -hmm. about it again. Okay, good. So Thank you. Okay. Is this motion on the floor? Yes, it is. Yeah. And if we're um, I just I, I do have one thing to yes, say about it. I, mm -hmm. I think it should just be referred to staff, not specifically to one staff member. Okay. Is everybody amenable with that? Yeah. Okay. Then let the motion be amended then so that it's referred to staff. Thank you. Rather than by law enforcement. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just make it slightly broader. Okay. All right. Are, you, well, you said bylaw officer. Yeah. Now I, I have no problem with to bylaw enforcement department. Okay. I, yeah. Normally we don't refer. We don't normally direct to a, a specific, specific person. We okay. can direct to staff and then let our CAO handle the most appropriate method. That is, that it's true. That is the that's the way that okay. we normally function. I think we can safely assume that we'll it will get there. Okay. Then I'll call the question. All in favor of the motion. Thank you, motion carried. All right, so we will move on. Um, for this next item of correspondence, because I have a personal relationship with both the letter writer and the artist, um, I'm gonna excuse myself from discussion on this agenda item just due to a personal conflict of interest and I'm gonna ask Councillor Bart, who's the deputy mayor this month, to handle the conversation while I'm out. Thank you very much. That's a good start. Thank you. So, Council, we have a letter uh, before us from uh, uh, George Patterson regarding um, installation of a public art works and uh, request to um, request that staff make an application to the Minister of Transport uh, to allow for the structure to be installed. How does Council wish to proceed? 
Councillor Fitt? Yeah, I think it's a wonderful idea. I just wasn't sure from the map. I just want to be 100% um, sure because there's no north, south, east, west on the map. Are we speaking to the corner adjacent to the Wolf in the Fog at the corner of 4th and Campbell? Okay. Yeah, if, if I may, um, the location is uh, on Campbell Street mm -hmm. at 4th and Campbell. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that it would go to highway is because of this kind of Campbell Street is a uh, provincial highway. Um, um, I have uh, had several conversations with the letter writer uh, about this idea going back to late last year. I've also talked to the Ministry of Transportation and Highways about uh, their thoughts on this. So we've figured out what the process is. The uh, Ministry would like the district to be the applicant. And uh, on behalf of the owner of the, of the, uh, of the sculpture, uh, Mr. Patterson has, has indicated that he's willing to loan it to the district, who could then um, make application to highways to, to do what's, what's uh, outlined in the letter. Along to the district for a couple of years, and uh, the, the owner of the Wolf and the Fog would be responsible for, for its maintenance as well as for insulation costs. Thank you. The, the uh, location? I, I, yeah, that's right. The location is, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know what else I can say. It's oh, no. Campbell, could you, put, well, can yeah, you put the map up on the screen, please? Because it, it's not completely clear. There's there is a, a little further. So this is fourth. Fourth disappeared. The laser pointer is attached to advancing slides. So the 4th Street here. Yeah. So we label this 4th. Campbell Street. This is the location that's proposed. But where is the crosswalk right now coming? From across Fourth Street, uh, the width of the crosswalk. Yeah, this location. So where where the corner rounds is where the two crosswalks come in. So there's one here, and, one here. and there's some paving stones uh, out on the curve of that in this area here. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so it's is it back of those two posts? Is yeah. it, uh, that's yes. my concern. Yes. Sorry, I took a picture this morning because I... Yeah, it, it won't be in the... It's behind those two posts. So it's really tight to the Wolf in the Fog building. So we'll determine a final location working with um, the other Mr. McPherson who's going to install it, or would install it, assuming the council endorses the district making this application. And it's not proposed to be... Um, those posts delineate not a parking space, but actually that was put there at the, the first phase of the, the so-called Fourth and Campbell project um, to allow for a curing radius for, for trucks coming up Fourth Street. Yeah. Uh, so it won't be in, in, in that location. Okay. Uh, highways wouldn't approve that location. Right. So it'll be inside of that, so more in the pedestrian realm than, rather than the vehicular realm. Did you have more? Yeah. Are you finished? Yeah, I just one further question and then is does staff see any uh, issues that we that we haven't that we don't know about through this correspondence that we should be aware of? Thank you. And that kind of couples with we've got a public art <coughs> policy. Some of that refers to receiving gifts and those kinds of things. So can you comment on implications? So um, this one aligns very nicely with public art policy and perfect world, we have our public art committee drawn together by now, but uh, it's not quite a perfect world. Uh, so this is coming to council rather than to the public art committee. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the one issue we did have a conversation with highways about was the sight line question, um, but we have a four-way stop at this location, which uh, you know, 
it indicates that the, the challenges that we might have with with uh, drivers needing to see um, you know, great distances for, to see oncoming traffic. Most people, at least two out of three people, actually stop at that stop sign. So you know, we're, we're we're confident that the, the sight line issue won't be a concern. Two out of three. Uh, Councillor Th uh, Thurgood, you. <coughs> that was out okay. of line. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Blanchett. Um, I, I wonder about a couple of things here. The, Mr. Patterson is talking about creating a, a concrete plinth, which is, which is a pretty substantial piece of uh, piece of construction, and uh, uh, the the term of the loan is two years, with he says a strong likelihood for renewal. Uh, if it weren't renewed would we be stuck with a concrete plinth with, uh, with nothing on it? And would that be a bad thing? And uh, my, other, my other concern is that we, previous council anyway, has, um, has passed this public art policy, uh, and yet we seem to be repeatedly um, circumventing that and just council making decisions. We made one uh, previously on, on a piece of public art that Mr. Law wanted to put up very good. I wonder if uh, it's time to just bite the bullet and put out uh, the appropriate call for a public art advisory committee and get this process underway uh, now and, uh, and deal with it uh, in the appropriate manner per the public art policy that has been passed. Okay. Um. Yeah, I tend to agree. I mean, I, I mean I'm in support of this, but yet again we're making another exception for the because we're not, not having a public health policy committee or whatever. So, um, you know, we're going to get inundated with requests of join the summit for people to put public art up. I mean, we have to get on with it. Also. So, although I have to support this, I would like to say uh, let's get this public arts committee formed or whatever. Um, Let me just respond to the public art question. Yeah. We do have a terms of reference that's that's substantially drafted at this mm -hmm. point. And it's, um, you know, I would anticipate it's going to be in front of council in the next two meetings. So uh, hopefully that allays the concern that this will, will push into the summer or, or, or next year or the next decade. <coughs> Any other comments from? Councillors, we have no uh, motion on the floor at this time as to how to deal with this. Um, yeah, I, I su support um, getting on with with both the idea of the, the getting the public art policy in place, but um, these that's exactly why we moved on it is fairly quickly when we 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 did get that drafted and. Um, still in the process of, of starting up, I would say. It's uh, maybe not as fast as we'd like, and we don't have as many resources as we'd like either, but um, for all the things we have on the go. But in the meantime, uh, I think we should support this and get on with it. The, the idea of authorizing staff to apply for the, the um, Permit, I guess, with the Ministry of Transportation. So I'll, I'll move that. Second. Okay, so the motion is to authorize staff to proceed with the application to apply to the Ministry of Transport uh, for the installation of the sculpture Nike at the southwest corner of Fork and Campbell Streets. Okay, we moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor McMaster. Any further discussion? Um, but are we, we're just moving that staff apply for the permit, not for the installation. We're just asking for the permit, really. Is that not what we're asking for? Not to be too nitpicky, but it, it says at the end of the letter, by directing staff to apply for this permit. So would that, in the broad sense, would that not be what we should do? And then the actual installation may or may not happen as a result. That's correct. At this point, we're directing staff as requested to apply for the permit according to the motion. Is that correct, Councillor Anderson? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it does presume that <laughs> if it installed, it wouldn't go ahead with the permit. But um, it, I'm just, maybe that's a question for staff. Is there a separate process for the installation? Uh, yeah. uh, to there, there, are, there are two components of this. One is the permit from transportation and infrastructure that, uh, um, again, I anticipate that it's a permit they will grant. The second is um, the um, loan of Nike to the district for a period of two years. And um, that will come back to council. That will come back to council. Um, that's something that I haven't been, staff have not been authorized to enter into that agreement, so that at this point we have to come back to council. Thank you. And, um, uh, and you have also let us know that a terms of reference for the public art policy would come also to council likely within a couple of weeks. Is that correct? Within a couple of meetings. A couple of meetings. So it's possible those may concur or come simultaneously. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor uh, to authorize staff to apply for and execute a permit from Ministry of Transport. Uh, Councillor Blanchett. Um, I haven't heard any response to my question about this plinth, five feet by seven feet, 16 inches tall, um, and what might happen uh, after two years if the loan of the sculpture is not um, renewed, would it just sit there uh, as a pedestrian bench, presumably? Would we find something else to put on top of it? Presumably a pretty solid piece of, of uh, installation. There, there would be a couple of options. I mean, one, um, we can discuss with, with uh, the, 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 the donor um, removing the plant. And the other option is, as was noted, is <coughs> We, we could, uh, through the public art process that we'll have going uh, well underway by two years from now, uh, we could seek to put another piece of, another piece of art there. Okay. I think we should get permission to install, a place to install it before we, and then worry about what we're going to do with the plate if we go by route. Okay, thank you, Councilman McMaster. Um, is there any other comment? I do have a couple, uh, uh, one query to our CAO. Uh, when the, where the plinth is constructed, and you're saying that that's not yet determined, should this go ahead? Uh, we've talked about pedestrian, um, the pedestrian friendly, pedestrian access, and at that corner, that conceivably could continue on, depending on what development happens, uh, you know, further along that corridor. Would this impede? Uh, the flow of pedestrian traffic along a pathway or sidewalk. Um, is that, would that be anticipated? The, the, the sidewalk will become smaller by, um, by virtue of there's something there. So, um, you know, if, if five people can walk abreast now, then maybe in, in the future only two will be able to walk, walk abreast there. Um, um, I don't think that that's likely to be a hardship um, to, uh, to pedestrian circulation in the neighborhood. Okay. Okay. Councilor McMaster? Uh, just a general question when it comes to public art. I mean, who's responsible for if it gets covered in graffiti and things like that for cleanup? So what was indicated in, in this is that the, in the letter is that the owner would be responsible for um, <coughs> maintaining Generally, in our public art policy, um, as we're establishing a fund, we will set aside some of that money for maintenance, which okay. means, so not specifically for this piece, but for there's, there's a piece that the district commissions in the future, um, we, would be, we would be setting aside money that can be used for, for, for maintenance. Okay, I just wasn't sure whether maintenance covered vandalism. Unfortunately, I, I think that it, it has come to cover that in municipality to have a yeah. robust public art. Okay, so I'm about to call the question unless we have um, any other comments from Council. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Blanchett. This is just a kind of a general comment, but the last two that I can recall public art proposals that have come before us 
have been kind of complete unto themselves, the artwork, the location, the installation. And uh, I just want to note that uh, our public art program has most of that stuff handled by the, the public art uh, committee. Uh, and this, this type of application would be kind of overkill or, or not really appropriate for the, for the public art acquisition program once we get our, our full program up and running. So we should just make a note of that for potential donors, I think. Is everybody clear on the message? Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I just will note uh, there in the public art, uh, there's you know a couple of strands of uh, the art that is donated and the art that the municipality acquires as part of the process. And um, you know, it's uh, how we manage that. Uh, you know, we'll see how we lay out the terms of reference and so forth. So anyway, that being yet to come, uh, as you pointed out, we have had a couple of opportunities. It seems to uh, be that there's an interest in having art in the community, and uh, uh, I think that's a good thing. So um, having said that, um, I would call the question. I will do that. So all those in favor of the motion? The motion carried. We make a separate motion separate. that um, we write a letter to Mr. Patterson thanking him for bringing this forward. Okay, thank you. Do I have a seconder? Second. Thank you. Councillor Thick. All in favour? Carried. Everybody. So we're going to move into the report section of our agenda and the first report is the Tofino event strategy and we have a presentation from uh, April and Maureen Douglas. Thank you very much. Thank you. So as Council is aware, uh, the district has been working to develop the Tofino event strategy and work on the project began in December and has been done with input from the event community. There's been a recognized need for a coordinated approach to Tofino's growing number of annual events. And the development of a formal strategy was supported by the recently adopted Tourism Master Plan. To assist with the development of the strategy, Tofino engaged Maureen Douglas, an event producer and communications professional with 30 years of experience and event creation, <laughs> sorry, um, event creation, production, and marketing. And the strategy is designed to help the community, including the producers of the individual events, the district, Tourism Tofino, and other event partners to leverage and build upon Tofino's current event program and to look at the way we are investing event in events and to refine our approach in order to get the highest overall return on our collective investment, uh, essentially to get the most bang for our limited bucks. The draft document, which Council is being asked today to adopt, is a roadmap laying out what I think is an achievable plan for the next five years. And joining us today to present the strategy is Maureen Douglas. And thanks for sitting through that long, <laughs> earlier part of the agenda. Thanks. My first council meeting, which was good. So thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. And just to clarify, on April's point, it, it, I did start my career at the age of eight. <laughs> it's kind of an, ongoing, <laughs> an ongoing joke with this group. So. Um, Excited to present this strategy, and I, I hope, I know some of you have participated in it with us, which has been just excellent to have your, your participation. But to get a sense of um, how we started and where we got to, this is the table of contents in the plan, which really takes us through that process. So uh, I was engaged in December, and by January I was here in a, what we call the discovery workshop with event stakeholders in the community, and some of you were also able to participate. And at that point, um, we worked with the group, and what was really exciting to me was to see that one, Tofino has a, a really impressive inventory of events already. But getting all the stakeholders in a room is something that hasn't happened a whole lot of. And so there was a lot of energy and opportunity to build on the collective uh, knowledge, experience, help bring uh, newer producers along with folks who've been in the game for a while and raise the capacity of all events here in Tofino by working together. So, 
the group came together and, and determined a vision and values guiding principles for the, for the plan, which greatly informed the work I did, everything from the suggestions of what could possibly be to what those guiding principles were. But I want to share the values because I think, one, they definitely uh, come up throughout the plan, but they were great values that will help deliver success within this community. So uh, the working group that came together chose sustainable, authentic, fun, which is in the event business is pretty darn important. That's got to be part of the experience for not just the people experiencing the event, but if the folks putting on art and having fun, it bleeds through. And, and so knowing that they want to own that here in Tofino is great. Uh, creative and innovative together and inclusive and collaborative. So that set a pretty good stage to develop, uh, essentially, as a April said, a five-year roadmap where we got to getting from good to great. The event community here are doing a really good job in a small community with not a lot of resources. But the excitement and the opportunity as an economic driver, a tourism driver, really comes when we get everybody to great. So the heart of the strategy focuses on the ability of, of all the event providers and some of the partners that we'll talk about to communicate, collaborate, and capacity build. Get those skill levels up uh, in event production, in product development, in getting some of the event uh, community start working with each other. There's some great opportunity for um, support on either end of culinary events or surf events, co-promotions, all kinds of different opportunities that will help develop audiences uh, from event to event. Marketing and communications, working with Tourism Tofino to help increase audiences both here in the community, community understanding and awareness and building ambassadors from the community to be telling others, but also increasing the destination visitor awareness of what Tofino has to offer um, and ways to do that by enhancing the whole overall brand of Tofino events, which I'll touch on. Funding, this, this plan is predicated on RMI funding maximizing the way that the district uh, applies it right now, but also looking at the, the, the reality that we all need in the event business other revenue sources. So what are opportunities for new revenue sources and sponsorship? And then in order to validate everything we're doing and, and have the community understand that there is proof, we actually have proof that this is working, that events and festivals can be a strong economic driver, a system of research and measurement has to, has to begin. And it could start right now this summer. So the plan touches on some ways to do that. And again, ways to do it collaboratively so all the event community uh, gains from that. So strategy highlights, it, collaboration is such an important part of this. In, able, in being able to work together, it's really important that not just the event community come together, but some of those key community partners who, who drive the messages. Uh, the district is, is, uh, has the RMI money, has some staff that's contributing to this right now, has an overall vision for wanting the community to have strong, stable economic growth. Uh, Tourism Tofino is your destination marketing organization, of course. Uh, the, the Chamber of Commerce hasn't been as actively engaged as I think they can be, and I met with them, and they were thrilled to be the advocates for being ambassadors in the community, for training up people through the Tofino Ambassador Program to create greater event awareness, more storefront awareness of what's going on in town, so everybody who's front line can be telling visitors, oh, there's a surf event on down the road, or have you gone down to check out the food event this weekend? Um, and I see that there's op opportunity too. I'd love to have the First Nation at the table. We had participation in our last workshop, and I think they're keen to grow opportunities to engage with that. And so having them at the table is important, along with Parks Canada, with the same sort of thing. They haven't been as engaged, but who's to say they don't have great ideas, and of course they're operating a big piece of the community. And with that, we also took a look at, at the events and saw that they kind of fall into five categories that align very well with the product marketing that Tourism Tofino is doing. So having an event representative at this working group from culture, culinary nature, surf and sport would round out um, the knowledge and, and the, the, uh, the awareness that's there at the table. But I'd love to see as, as well a mix of experience, a mix of age, all of those things factor into how people can share information and who knows what, especially as we're looking at, you know, some people might have longer term event production experience, whereas other people are really amazing with social media, some of the newer things. And this group then, which really would be there to lead and drive the plan, and it, it acts as a community-based working group. I, I don't recommend it be a committee of council, that it actually has more freedom to build those relationships within the event stakeholder community and, and drive that plan that the event stakeholder community uh, responded to with, with some enthusiasm, which was great. And that right now, the District of Tofino RMI Festivals and Events Assistant is sort of piecemeal helping different festivals as possible. But if there's a collective plan that everyone's moving forward with year by year, 
that that role becomes the person who helps drive the plan, coordinate that table, make sure people are achieving the different um, objectives that have been set out and really helping to keep pace and make sure we're all moving forward. And, and the purpose of engaging even further some of those key community stakeholders, it strengthens the plan is the first thing. And of course, having that kind of buy-in and, and commitment from key community partners is going to have a big influence with your community population as well. But as mentioned with the District of Tofino, there's your funding through the RMI funds, you have the role that already uh, assists festivals and events, and I think can do so in a greater capacity. Uh, and there's an opportunity for collective volunteerism as well. Right now we have close to 25 events out there every year asking for almost all the same things from all the same people. But if we were able to get, condense those down into one great ask a year, two asks a year, and then there's a pool of different resources including volunteers, now we've got efficiencies that are helping business and helping events. Tourism Tofino, I've had an opportunity to meet with them and they're excited about the idea of shifting some of that event marketing to come down under those categories that align with what they're already marketing and what Tofino is well known for. Um, it's hard to sell each event that, that's somewhat modest. Tofino is, is really an example of your event scene is going to become very strong as is some of the parts. There's no one event right now that is world known and, and sort of is, is at the top of the heap and everybody knows it. But if you start to brand all the events together and market them under those different offerings like surf and sport and nature and things that Tofino's known for, uh, each event itself has an oppor uh, opportunity to grow, but awareness and participation grows even more because people know the kind of things that when they, when they get here, they're going to be able to experience. As mentioned, the Chamber of Commerce is quite keen to help us get the event messaging out, turning every, <coughs> virtually every local in this community can be an ambassador for events with better knowledge and become uh, greater particip participatory audience members as well. There's room for growth there. Also, uh, as a conduit to help engage business in Tofino a little bit better in community sponsorship as well. And when we can show some of the results with measurement, it's going to help to keep some of those businesses involved uh, with fewer asks, but hopefully greater return. The First Nation, I think it's so important, there's volunteer opportunities, a chance to engage both communities in shared celebration is a huge way to to um, further those relationships. And through the plan, it talks about not just including the First Nation and their talent within the different festivals as appropriate, but getting to the point where the First Nation itself has, uh, there's a First Nation or Aboriginal celebration led by the local nations here. I think there's huge opportunity to do that. Uh, with Parks Canada, creating that event awareness to park visitors and partnering with events to host activities. They're, they're, they've expressed interest in being more engaged. So that's a great sign and good timing. As April mentioned, it is a five-year roadmap, and the, the theme I, I, I used and I say it in there, it's very much tactical and practical. This, these are all achievable objectives, with, and the roadmap offers achievable step-by-step -step tasks, so that capacity is even being built year by year. Not just certain objectives are being met, but each year the whole event community is greater skilled to deliver the plan at a slightly higher level. So the first year, now right in 2015, if this plan is adopted, uh, a plan of capacity building through the event community starts, uh, that collaboration, assessing the five years, everybody kind of rolling up their sleeves and seeing what each of them can do to both leverage their own event but collectively leverage all of them. By 2016, you're seeing the reflection of that. There's maybe some more collaboration, audience building from event to event or cross promotions, cross programming between events. So uh, the Food and Wine Festival is gaining audience for the Oyster Festival and vice versa, those sort of things. They're working together to, to increase the entire market. By 2017, it, it includes RFPs for new events, particularly focused on shoulder and winter, which we know there's definitely room for growth. And extending our reach through media, through stronger media messages where there's international content and investo at the festivals here, pushing that more through media too to create more international awareness that can then build and get you re that return by 2018. You've got a strong sense of local pride where there's greater awareness, uh, better quality, uh, greater results with the festivals that bring that local pride and international attention. And by 2019, with that market research and measurement underway and the, the tasks of the plan achieved, this community is definitely celebrating from good to great with some pretty exciting platforms that can be leveraged. So the Tofino, the Tofino community brand as a, as a destination is already very strong. And I think there's real opportunity, again, rather than trying to put 25 small messages into the larger market, not within the community where there's a knowledge base already, but 
when you extend into those markets you're going out to to get destination visitors. Branding Tofino events creates opportunity for market alignment with Tofino, with tourism Tofino. It creates opportunities potentially for sponsorship, for merchandise, um, and then marketing those events, as I've mentioned, under the categories already aligned with Tofino will help strengthen that brand. And it's a brand that all the festivals could use. So Tofino Events Presents or Tofino Events is that marker. And it allows for collaborative sponsorship uh, sales to go out outside the community and bring in some of the bigger corporations or companies that may have product here or may <coughs> be interested in the, in the uh, audience you receive, but they don't necessarily have a storefront here but they definitely may have more money than some of the small businesses that have already been very generous in, in working to help support and contribute to events. And I think the other thing happening, and it was you know, interesting this morning hearing um, about the tsunami response, and just there's obviously a very important and, and well-developed eco-responsible aware community here that Tofino has a real opportunity to leverage as well. I, I, being in the event business for a long time, I'm seeing, thankfully, a very strong growth and movement to green events, truly sustainable events, zero waste operations, um, reduce, reuse, all those sort of messages, um, greater efficiencies even in purchasing, sustainability across the board, economic, social, and environmental. But I think specifically in Tofino, there's an opportunity to, to really green the events you do. It's important to where you are anyway, but to become a best practice community would be another exciting uh, media opportunity. It's an exciting platform with the events that go hand in hand with the Tofino brand, whether it's this idea of Tofino events naturally spectacular, because they are just, you know, the second we step outside, you've achieved that. But those kind of ideas to, to really leverage it and bring all those events to a, a high, higher caliber of green and sustainable responsibility. So in, in closing, the commitments to make this succeed are there and I think you know the top one is important reliable funding I know has been a challenge in, in RMI it's the great fund that we're given but could potentially be taken away <laughs> which makes it hard to plan and it's sometimes very hard to plan when they confirm the funding late in the game now I realize that funding's been confirmed through 2017 but this is a five-year plan that goes to 2019 so one of the considerations would be and uh, I don't you I leave it with you but that the funding in this plan has stayed very consistent. I haven't said, you, well, you get, you roughly apply $60,000, $62,000 to RMI funds to festival and events every year, but this plan needs you to put in 100000 or this plan needs you to put in 200000 No. Working with essentially within the ballpark of the funding you have and that you currently apply, just using it a little bit differently, but again, more collaborative leverage with that money, will help us get there. But if for some reason the RMI program were to end in 2017, in order to see the plan through, I would ask the council to consider being able to fund the plan as per the budget, which I think is $62,000 in the 2018-2019 years, um, so that the community can really see it to its fulfillment. With that additionally, collaboration amongst the event community will be key. It's, it's a bit of a, a newer way to work, but we've spent quite a bit of time talking about that with them, and they're excited at the possibilities. Um, being creative together, opening up a whole new wave of creativity. When you start to hold hands and say, what can we do? How can my event enhance yours? There was discussion about creating more our arts and culture opportunities within events as well. I think there's huge opportunity for the arts community to lend their skills, their talent, uh, and materials uh, aligned with the right events, like a uh, adventure photographer surf show when one of the surf events is on, so a photo exhibit, etc things with sculptors. I mean, it, it just goes on and on. V visual art aligning with these different things, film, being able to bring in different elements of the arts. So uh, the creativity aspect has no limit. And then the one thing I talked about with the event stakeholders is often creativity and adding quality and experience and programming to festivals doesn't cost any money. It just takes some creative ideas. Um, and partnerships. So those include partnerships amongst the event community, but also those partnerships with the key community stakeholders who really all seem keen to come at events from a more collaborative point of view to see what we can achieve together. Um, and making sure that there's strong communication along the way. Uh, good leadership from the RMI team here at, at the district will make a difference as well in making sure that all the event partners are stay in um, con it's just constant communication off the, off the top, but regular communication. So they're celebrating the shared progress, they're celebrating individual successes, because ultimately those individual successes will add up to collaborative success, I think, for the Tofino event community. 
and by extension, absolutely, the Tofino community as a whole. That's really the ultimate goal. So that's it in a, in a pretty small nutshell, and I welcome any questions you might have. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. We have to start. I'm sure there's a few questions, or maybe there's one. Yeah, I thought it was a stellar report. I mean, just really excellent, and uh, the five-year strategy was excellent, and the way he broke it down um, into those blocks of communicate, collaborate, capacity build, and um, yeah, the only <coughs> thing that I, I think I might have expressed, and maybe nobody else did in the workshop, but the, the one I was able to attend was this this um, idea that, that in Tofino we are also trying to build a, a, a learning economy here and this idea that, that educational components could be also part, not of every event, uh, but, but in the case of the Shorebird and the Whale Festival, I think, I think those educational components have added huge dimension and value and I, I for one have spoken to many people who said they really enjoy you know that that component. So I, I'm surprised it didn't come out stronger. But I would I would be happy to move <coughs> that um, recommendation that is um, there. But I'm, I'll leave it for other comments, perhaps as well. So you're not making a motion. I do, but um, if it's your call. If, would you like to make the motion? I'll make the motion, and maybe the discussion can happen. Okay. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Second. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Okay. So there is a motion on the floor to adopt the strategy. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a very, very good report as well. And, and the, my hesitation, and I'm not with adopting it so much, is it's a bit daunting and <laughs> to be able to achieve that. I, I think with the RMI funds in place, the financial part is, is meetable. Um, uh, but I, I sort of would like know or have some sense of what re resources it would require of the district what would it is it, can we cover it off with the, the current resources or I, I anticipate that there will be a little more work <laughs> to be done so I that I guess that's, I don't know if that question can be answered right now but I'll ask if mm -hmm. she has any comment Sure, so as the plan is laid out, um, obviously, I, I'm not sure if you're referring to the dollar amount that is identified in the, fi in the table for 2018, 2019. Is that what you're referring to in terms of like, the financial um, resources? No, somewhere? I'm thinking of staff resources. What mm -hmm. if, we, if we do adopt the plan and, and mm -hmm. want to, with, with the idea of having some success with it, we would have to. Um, I think have more staff resources, and I'm just wondering if that's covered off by the current um, uh, festival coordinator and what staff we have. Or so I think in terms of uh, human resources, it's not that we're adding uh, a requirement for more human resources, we're just changing the way those resources are used. So we're changing the approach uh, that the staff position that currently assists events takes, and this really lays out a very clear work plan for for that position for the next five years or for the next for the duration of the plan. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think perhaps I have the answer to the question, but I'll ask it anyway. Before I do though I want to say it really is an, a stellar uh, report as Councillor Thick uh, said. Uh, it uh, um, you know I I'm chair chairing currently the economic development committee and I see this very much as, as a kind of um, a logical expression of uh, what needs to happen in the community around vitality in the economic development sector and um, this really points a direction really solidly. So the question I have more uh, it has to do with um, uh, something that you have kind of highlighted sort of further on in the plan, like 2018, that sort of signature event. And I, I just have a sense that we have a number of festivals that have gone on for a very long time. And I'm wondering what your thinking is about why not to kind of almost start in that place of identifying signature events to which are f further invested and further resourced and so forth at the council table 
I've advocated for um, that approach when we do the um, uh, resort funding. And so I'm just interested in what your thoughts are about that. And, you know, I mean. Mm -hmm. Um, there are, there's two elements really in terms of that kind of more like product additions and, and just to um, the other councillor's point, I also wanted to mention in terms of product development, I definitely see education and workshops as, as opportunities, lectures, you know, TED is, TED is such a big deal, all those sort of things are very of the time as well, not only good content. I didn't want to be absolutely prescriptive about what to add, but product development and a capacity building workshop on product development and capacity building workshops through this year are one of the things recommended in the plan. So that's where some of those pieces can be workshopped out with the community, including the development of a signature event. The, one of the, uh, I think there is opportunity there, I think there's some strong enough, I think one of the challenges uh, leading up to there will be, with the, does the working group determine what's the strongest event? to become a signature event that isn't new. And that, you know, that, that can have its ramifications and challenges. I, you have a very knowing smile on your face as I say that. But not to say that uh, maybe everyone feels in the community that f food events are some of our strongest. And the signature event actually becomes a collaboration between two or three of those food events. So again, the opportunity for creativity and maximizing return on uh, existing resources some of this, I absolutely, I feel as the consultant, it's very important to leave that with the community. It's not going, I want to do it. But when you're too prescriptive, the event stakeholders have to own this, along with the district where you do see the results. Where's the greatest responsibility, accountability? It's not just the pizzazz of an event, because if you grow an event that didn't have a strong enough foundation, they might have some pizzazz, but then you have structural problems, or you know, they're, it's, it's, it's challenging, they're not adhering to bylaws. I mean, I've seen a number of very successful cowboy events, and then they run, they, you know, run by so-called mavericks and cowboys, but they crash after about two or three years, because they keep begging for forgiveness. So there's a lot of different ways to come at it. I also, I mean, there's, there's also an opportunity for everybody at the event working group to take a look at the plan and say, you know, we want to go with something new, community driven, but that will actually be our winter event. The new signature event is something we're going to invest in in the winter, which would be fairly radical, but pooling that money. So there has to be room within the plan, and again, why I think it's important that it is a community working group, is that there's, there's X amount of money assigned to this. But with creativity, one, we hope there's more revenue opportunities, but being able to move that money around for what everyone believes is the best outcome. So that it's not absolutely prescriptive, but it's one heck of a strong roadmap. But if, uh, you know, they want to take a left turn somewhere along the way, the community needs to be able to do that and put its stamp on it. So um, it, it's absolutely not of the question. Community ideas have to ultimately take, o take this over. And, uh, and that's why, as you say, it's very tactical and actionable but where there's room for different ideas. So maybe it does grow from the community, or it's something where we've always talked about wanting to do this, and that becomes the new, whatever this is, becomes the signature event. If I may just have one more. Um, the, um, the role that uh, you, you said you've talked about your career in the events world, and I was at a Creative Cities conference, and I think it was Revelstoke, they had somebody who, um, created events in that community. I, I'm just trying to understand what or how the role of somebody in, in your position as events coordinator was mm -hmm. crafted. How was it described? How did it play out on the ground? And have you observations as to how that applies to what sure. you presented? In, in, my, in my history, it, it rolled out a little bit differently. And very quickly, I, I can explain for the benefit of some counselors who, who haven't heard that is, um, I came out of theater school and went right into the event business in, in Vancouver, essentially, uh, and ran a small uh, art not-for-profit that was involved with events, particularly street performers. Uh, and by 1990, I was working full-time for Tourism Whistler because they had hired my, the, the, the society I worked with to start programming street entertainment under contract in Whistler back in the day when you know, the sidewalks still rolled up in summer and that was the perception and there was almost no summer market. The success of just that street animation program alone led them to decide to start funding festivals and wanted a full-time person to help develop them. So I was hired, and from 1990 to, to 1999, I was there for just under 10 years, 
I, it was a very fortunate position to be in. <laughs> You're going to regret having asked me this question because we spent a, we spent a significant amount of money. And as somebody from the nonprofit art sector, it was an amazing experience to actually have some tools like money to be able to develop festivals. That said, each of them was, it was $20,000 here and $25,000 there. It was not massive money, but it changed the environment for Whistler and, and visitors to Whistler that there was a lot going on. We added a new event every year. By about halfway through uh, the 90s, we were ready to take on some risk and, and start doing significant concert productions on the top of the mountain and that sort of thing, which was a much more expensive venture. But we had the, we had the audience and we had the confidence that we could do that. And we had to be able to afford to lose a little bit of money. And in the end, all, they all came out in the black. Um, it, it did a huge amount to grow summer business. It, in that time frame, the kind of activity we brought into to the community resulted in a, uh, that summer visitors surpassed winter through that decade, and, and bringing summer alive had a lot to do with it. But the difference here, which is to me really exciting, I've walked into a community with established festivals, and the, even the ones that are fresher and younger, uh, newer to the community, they, they know what they're trying to do. So you already have this remarkable foundation. I think when you have limited resources, the power of collaboration and including collective resources. There's 25 events that happen here every year. Our, I'm recommending things like put a quote out for all the AV equipment all those festivals need. You get a, one or two providers, or you know, however many providers quoting on that, that's a lot different than 25 quotes going out for business. Like there's savings that those festivals could experience by starting to share that. There's, uh, things like, you know, parking barricades, those sort of things that the, the district could potentially invest in and then share out for maybe lower fees than it would cost to, to rent from a commercial operator. Now you're, again, raising capacity, giving them some tools and reducing their overall cost that they can then put into programming or expansion. So it's all of those sort of things, but communication, collaboration and capacity building are absolutely the tickets to arriving where we want to arrive in five years from now. Thank you. Um, I, I quite like your, your characterization of this as a stakeholder uh, driven initiative that it shouldn't be a council group, it should be a, an event stakeholder group. Just wondering what you see as the role of council in, uh, in coming years in, uh, in watching or helping this, uh, this plan go forward, apart from the potentially taking over some funding responsibilities after 2017. Well, I think first things first, I want to count, quote Councillor Blanchett from the workshop he was able to attend, and one of them, you can help with recruiting more men to the cause. You're here, you're doing your job, and it's true. You can all be advocates for all of this, for greater volunteerism, for why to get involved, for businesses that maybe are like, I don't even understand events, that you become advocates for what it can mean to the community. It enhances the quality of community life, the experience of living here, but also, of course, enhances the experience of everyone else coming to Tofino. Not everybody understands the long-term impacts of events, and it tends to take about three years of any plan, any one event to get traction. So I, frankly, being cheerleaders and advocates is a very important role. Um, and and ha supporting those other community partners we talked about, like the Chamber, like Tourism Tofino. We're talking about a little bit of a change for the way Tourism Tofino markets events, and they like it. It allows them to stay under their brand a little easier than having to adopt the brands of 25 events, but potentially do a better job marketing all of them. Um, and in ha having every, every, all of those events enhance their skill sets and promotion. So I think as you see those programs come forward, as you see community engagement opportunities come forward, that you really support them all and help explain them. That's, that's the biggest piece I think you could do right now, in addition to um, creating assurance on that funding for five years, even if RMI can't be counted on from where we sit right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, final. All right, I'll call the question and on motion. All in favor? Thank you. Motion carried, thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very much appreciated. <coughs> Okay, moving on, we have the Clackett Sound Community Theatre License to Occupy, and uh, there is a staff report and then an accompanying copy of the five-year lease and the recommendation from staff that uh, the license be renewed and um, that the Mayor and Corporate Officer be authorized to 
execute the agreement, and I'm sorry, Councillor Blanchett, you were going to. I will absent myself. I don't have any direct fiduciary interest here, but I volunteer with this group, so I feel I should so you not are going be to in the room for the. So for you are session. declaring a conflict of interest. Yeah, yeah, just need you yes. to say the words. Perfect. Thank you. <coughs> Well, I'll move the recommendation. Thank you. Second. Any discussion? Yeah, just a yep. yeah, question. I presume that uh, the terms of the uh, agreement are satisfactory to the uh, community theatre? That there's been discussion and now it's, or is that? None. Your Worship, the terms of the agreement haven't changed. Um, if any significant concerns are raised, then then we can address them. But at this time, we're proposing an agreement with the same terms for five years. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Vick? Uh, just a question on uh, point 3.4, uh, used by the District of Tofino. Um, there should be no fees charged for meetings, concerts, and performances. The district is required to engage the services of the theater's technician, and so on. Um, it doesn't say there. Uh, can, what, in other words, what, if the district requires this space, because we are in a very, very tight space crunch for a meeting mm -hmm. in a year and a half time, but it doesn't say, like, is there, is it, does there need to be something written down? Is there 24 hours notice? Is there anything like that? But say, I'm just thinking ahead, two years. If our needs change for some reason, um, does that allow us the opportunity to do what the district needs to do in case they need to do it. Thank you. Nyla. Thank you, Worship. Um, there, the theater has always been very accommodating. If we have had to have a meeting there, which hasn't happened often, and I know times could change, um, I, don't, I don't foresee there being an issue. We work, we work together on any scheduling conflict as well as there, there is a termination clause in the agreement. If our needs change significantly, then council can exercise that clause. Thank you. Thank you. Any final discussion? Call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Motion is carried. Thanks, Aaron. Next up is an amendment to parking <coughs> the parking in lieu bylaw. So parking in lieu amendment bylaw number 1176.02, a report in your package, and this is to correct an administrative error that occurred and um, to correctly record the number of parking in lieu spaces that were purchased by one business. And the recommendation is that the parking in lieu amendment bylaw be introduced and read at first, second, and third time. Okay, so Councillor Anderson moves and Councillor Bart seconds that the parking and the amendment bylaw number 1176.02-2015 be introduced and read a first, second, and third time. Are there any questions or is there any discussion on this? Okay, I'll call the question then. All in favor? Thank you. Motion is carried. And last uh, report on our agenda today is the Federal Gas Tax Strategic Priorities Fund application. The report in the agenda and a recommendation from staff that staff be authorized to submit a grant application to the Federal Gas Tax Strategic Priorities Fund Capital Infrastructure Project Stream in the amount of $1,223,219.49 to fund the Bars Mountain Reservoir and uh, Water Main Upgrade Project. I'll move. Thank you, Councillor. McMaster moves the recommendation. Second. Seconded by Councillor Blanchett. Any questions or discussion on this? Just as we heard this morning from um, our director of finance, it certainly underscores for me <laughs> the need to make sure that we have money. Um, I mean, should this not go through, and this seems to be a, a fairly urgent need, it certainly underscores to me the need for that reserve fund in the wa for water infrastructure. So I just hope that all the T's can be crossed and the I's dotted that we're, that we're successful as this. Um, I just wanted to get this clarification on some things that, uh, is this, I believe we applied for
for a grant before for this project mm -hmm. and were turned down. I'm just wondering if it's the same fund that we're applying to and also if our application, our grant application has changed much since the last one. Thank if you. there's any comments on how I'd like to know. Okay. <coughs> um, Your Worship, the <coughs> Uh, we did recently apply for um, a Builds Canada Fund, a new Builds Canada Fund uh, grant as well. So we will have two applications in stream at the same time for the same project. If we receive one, then we would decline the other, and it might be a bit of uh, kind of wing-wonging. Historically, um, I don't know details. I understand that previously with grant applications there were concerns and I think they might have been, you know, with the previous iterations of the Build Canada Fund. Um, there were concerns through the province that, you know, we didn't have a water conservation plan. And, um, um, so uh, I think we've resolved a lot of that. I'm, I'm actually quite confident in the, the level of detail in particular that's gone to our, our Build Canada, with our Build Canada application that we're putting the best case forward that we can. Now, at the end of the day, there, there are decisions that are made um, somewhat politically, but also how many people does it benefit? Um, the good thing about the um, Strategic Priorities Fund for infrastructure that the Council is considering now is it is meant to, you know, in the, in the, in the application package, it's meant for large projects that are beyond the reach of a community. So this one, to me, really kind of fits that. We have a town of 1,800 people in a $1.2 million project. Um, and uh, so hopefully we're able to make the case that this is something that's difficult for this little town to do, but very necessary. Thank you. Councilor Wright? No, thank you. I, I'm thinking about Councilor Anderson's question, and I believe it was the Bar Forest Mountain Reservoir, and there was a um, BC government green fund, uh, and an application was made quite a long time ago. Um, and the feedback that I, I guess I talked to one of the UBCM ministries, um, open houses, was that the conservation side of it wasn't part of it, and it wasn't like there was nothing that referred to it as a green project, so it didn't it didn't fit the criteria, and there were so many applications. Okay. So I think that that's why it didn't happen previously. Thanks. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Motion is carried. Thank you. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our business and the open meeting, and we do have an opportunity for questions. Anybody has any? Okay, thank you very much. I'll ask somebody to read the motion to go in camera, please. Mr. Anderson? Why not? <coughs> okay. <coughs> I'll move uh, that the meeting be closed to the public pursuant to sections 91. A, C, E, and G of the Community Charter to discuss matters relating to personal information about an individual who has, holds a position as an office, employee or agent, employee relations, the acquisition, disposition, or expri expropriation of land or improvements, and litigation or potential litigation affecting the munici municipality. Thank you. Seconder? Councillor McMaster, thank you very much. All in favor? Thank you. Motion is carried.